first of all i i want to welcome all of you uh i am munishi sanyal from iit madras and i am the chief upstart of this iit startups see nobody caught that one <laughs> okay uh this is the first of six sessions that we are going to have uh first of six sessions that we're going to have to be able to complete a quote unquote course it's not really a course but basically i did a survey last year and uh, i identified what were the soft spots i mean i was uh, aman walia who was the bari president he said i just recovered from an open heart surgery so he said now that your energy has come back full he said why don't you do something more useful so i said okay uh um i will start this thing i found that our weaknesses and we iits are on a major climb we are fourth ranked uh in terms of the number of unicorns we produced after stanford harvard berkeley then it's us we are ahead of mit i rubbed that into desh desh on this face <laughs> anyway so uh the point is uh we want to cover this gap because it the, at the inaugural event i did uh have vinod khoshla speaking first because he's one of our pioneer entrepreneurs he didn't have the benefit of the big iit name but then we put together a program in 2003 where we talked about iit as being entrepreneurs and generating jobs and all that and after that it was it was aired on 60 minutes uh, in 2003 three times and we became a household name after that the startups after that have had a easier time but now to make sure that there are no further slippages we are trying to really tighten it and have identified certain weak spots the first weak spot we're going to address today how do you identify an idea okay now to identify an idea some people uh, by the way i just i must say that most iitians who do startups are techies so they then tend to follow the line where their technology skills are they are not business people they're not I, i mean they're not business people in the first round after doing two three startups then of course they see the business side of things and they're willing to do, take a shot at anything but how do you identify an idea and sanjay fortunately corrected me and sanjay told me that look we need to be able to do the market research and due diligence first otherwise you could be going two years up the wrong trail and then suddenly realize oh i got need to make a pivot the vc you know for him it's a gamble he will recover his money but you lost two years of your time you will never get that back so before you start on the journey the startup journey you must be sure that you are picking the right line that you want to go for so that is the reason for this very first event we have here shwak satyavelu of iit madras we have rakesh mathur of iit bombay sanjay mittal of iit kanpur and all their re resumes are given in that sheet you know and they uh, have done multiple startups with successful exits so they've got tremendous credible track record and they can tell you from their experiences uh you know what are the things to be done actually i was ideally looking for people who had some mixed fortunes that means some success some failure because i remember when i was starting this thing somebody told me there was a non profit accelerator that failed that didn't you know go this thing and the first thing i did was i called up the guy i want to, i want to meet you he said why do you want to meet me i failed i said that's why i want to meet you because you know you learn a lot from failures so that is a th uh, so this is week week point number 1 the second and third session is the one that i think most iitians at least people like you they hate you know raising money they hate raising money and they don't realize that you know what no money and you're going nowhere okay so you got to get the right idea you got to have the right amount of money then you have a chance of achieving success and the third ingredient is uh is uh good business development okay and uh, now i missed a point out that right in the beginning choosing an idea 
comes along with one other item is selecting a very good team. I think in the inaugural event, you heard Vinod Khosla. He told us that he used to sit outside uh, Andy Bechtel, Bechtelsheim's office and one other guy, I forget, he used to sit outside the guy's office. The moment the fellow came out, he would drive his car up and catch the guy. So, I mean, that's how desperate he was to get the right person. So, that becomes a very, very important uh, aspect, that these three things need to be corrected. Now, one other complaint I had, multiple, from my own group, you know, the, this thing, they said, you know, this is too large an audience. We should have small groups of five or ten people at a time. I said, five or ten people, we can't get an eminent panel like this to come repeatedly to address five or ten people. That's not possible. So I will do this in mass, but what we will do later on is through our mentor group program, we are going to set up uh, people who can mentor smaller groups and more frequently so that anything you missed out on, you can catch up with. But just keep in mind one thing, that the viewpoints of one panelist or somebody else you met may not coincide with somebody else's viewpoint, and everybody might be right. You know, they have, in their own way, they might be doing the right thing. Now, we are going to set up in our website a Q&A sort of a portal where anybody can pose a question, and the question can be answered by anybody, okay? In other words, uh, the mentor could answer it, uh, any of you, I mean, uh, have run into a similar experience, can say, you know what, I ran into the exactly the thing, and this is what the guy did to me, you know. So you could share your experience also. Now, now we'll get into the topic, but before that, I would just explain the format. We are taking two items. Um, just one sec. May I have a program sheet? Okay. You got the program sheets with you. Uh, item number one and two are interchangeable, so I'm going to take them together. We are, I'm going to just first open the concept, and then I'm, open it, I'm going to open it up to the panelists, and they're going to share their experiences of those items. And following that, there'll be a Q&A. And I'm expecting that the Q&A will be very rich, because I think a lot of you have a lot of questions. So, okay, so we will do one and two together, the number three item, which is the team building, I'll take it up separately. And number four, on the business plan, we're going to go very light on that because Naeem is going to cover that when he tells you about how to build a pitch. In the next session, which is on 8th of March, you know, we're meeting at the same place, he's going to cover that in great depth, okay? Is that right? Right. So he's going to be covering that. So I, 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 we won't... Uh, number four is something I could as well erase, but let's hear their views. I mean, it's not every other day we get a group of panelists like them. So, uh, now, now we start the topic about how do you get an idea? The one, the one issue is that, you know, you've got a absolutely revolutionary idea, it's new, it's it's a disruptive technology, and that's something nobody's ever encountered. And you, you, know, you come into the market based on that. The second one is you're addressing an existing problem. There's a problem. Everybody sees it. And you find a solution to that. And the solution could be maybe faster, cheaper, more features, smaller, miniaturized. Any of these things could be a selling point, why you want to come out with it. Then there are bridging products. You know, Oracle comes out with some products, somebody else has come out with another product, and you find many companies use both the products, but they don't have a bridge between the two. And you go and build connectors, adapters, whatever, I mean, anything that sort of allows these things to talk. I mean, the major companies won't think of it. They're not interested in it because of the fact that you're going to dilute their market. So they want you to... Uh, you know, they want to lock you in, but I mean, let's say today in the cloud, there's this big rush for AWS, and that's got all these guys like Microsoft, Google, IBM, all of them are really nervous because of the fact that uh, AWS market share, I mean, their total revenue is more than eight, more than the next eight guys put together. 
I mean, that's how dominant they've become, you know. But, you know, Google has put up a building, if you've noticed, Google Cloud. If you go along 237, you'll see that building. So, I mean, everybody is desperately going for That's an obvious move, okay. Whether, so, in terms of... Uh, uh, I mean, in terms of the ideas, I mean, you, you can do that. And number two is the market research. Uh, we are trying to tie up with some companies and uh, what we've told them is that you guys are startups. So I broadly hear this, that if you're pre-funded, they might give you market survey access uh, against stock. But if you're funded past Series A, you need to pay, but they may give heavily discounted rate for IITLs. Uh, I'm trying to see how I can strike a legally correct way where we can, we can pay for the site. IIT startups can pay for the site, and all of you guys can come and have a peep, you know, little peep show out here. Go on. <laughs> so, you know, uh, now, if it is okay by them, I'll say, look, these guys are pre-funding. They, they haven't even got the idea set, but, you know, there could be a future successful run for you. So we want to do it that way. Uh, okay, the team part, I'll come together uh, later. The other thing is there is a... Hey, wait, there was a guy helping me with the thing. Uh, you know, you need to do a sector-wise analysis. I think I'll show it to you later because I, want, I don't want to delay this. But in all the horizontal scale areas, like whether it's cloud, big data, analytics, uh, IoT, uh, you know, AI, machine learning, and all of these, as applied to all the vertical sectors, whether it's uh, BFSI or it's uh, telecom, pharmaceuticals or hospitality or various sectors. I've got a long chart for that. I will circulate it to you by email. I know I have your email addresses. So maybe you can look at it that way and then decide that, hey, am I going to go um, that I'm an AI specialist and I'm going to go across all the sectors or will I first pinpoint and take one? I'm going to go for the healthcare provider market. And you become strong and specialized in that before you start moving to other sectors. Now, that said, I want to hand over to our panelists to give their viewpoints on the, what uh, the broad uh, outlines I've provided. But please, go way outside the outline because I, I do not have your kind of experience. You have got live experience, which I don't. Well, sure. Can you, can you tell me what your outline is? Oh, <laughs> the, uh, You got a mic? Okay, we all have mics. Go ahead. All right. Um, my name is Schwark, and uh, as you can see from my background, I have uh, in the last 20 years I've spent 18 years as an entrepreneur, and and the last two years I've been spending as a VC. So I have um, my my perspective is basically formed from both sides of the table, if you may, right? But the bulk of it as uh, being through uh, it as an entrepreneur. Manishi said, hey, you know, uh, these guys have had uh, successful companies who are looking for people with failed startups. Um, the only thing I'll say to that is that every successful company is a failed startup somewhere along the way before it actually becomes what you think of as a successful company. Um, but I also have the experience of starting a company that I actually shut down within three months. So nobody even knows I started that company because nobody talks about it. Um, and so what's interesting, as you think about these topics of, of idea, I have a maybe somewhat controversial point of view, which is that I don't think the idea actually matters as much. Um, I think fundamentally what is much more important, at least in my mind, is your passion for a space and your ability or your expertise in that space. I, I think, think of it as like a founder market fit, right? So that is, are you the best person to go do something in this particular market? And the second thing that I think is important is size of market. Like if you actually do, did something somewhere in this space, is this actually gonna be worth it? And it may not be exactly what you started out doing, 
but something in that space where you are still have great founder market fit and the problems are actually large enough or profitable enough that if you did solve them can be worth you know large value creation uh, um, uh, opportunities exist so in my mind that's far more important than a specific idea uh, as i said uh, i've started three companies one that we eventually took public one that we sold to mastercard and one in between those two that actually shut down in three months and the first one uh, was actually a, a company that aggregated web data across the web and this was back in 99 so shortly after the web itself was starting to become more popularly used rakesh actually funded me for that uh, for that uh, company um and what's interesting in that scenario is again i i was a fresh graduate i had barely any experience at all but what i did do is I actually started um building the iit madras web page so the very first web page that iit madras ever created i was a team of about three or four of us that were at iit madras at the time and we actually ended up creating the first iit madras website so the web itself this was back in 95 94 95 and so there was a the web itself was brand new so nobody knew anything about the web it was all brand new we were all teaching ourselves stuff and we were trying to build stuff stuff out so and when i started my first company you could argue i had no founder market fit but i happened to be one of the few people that actually had the longest amount of exposure to stuff on the web at that time right so while i was clueless i was probably the 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 one-eyed man among the blind if you may right so it feel it i was i still had a better fit to kind of go after that opportunity than probably most people in at that time the second company i started actually i decided i the the first company i started actually ended up in financial services through many twists and turns and um uh, not that i knew anything about financial services but by the end of it after 8 years i actually was an expert in financial services and uh the second company i started i said i don't want to do anything with financial services that's you know i'm tired of it i don't want to do anything with that i'm going to go start something completely different and so i picked video advertising as my my idea to go start and that actually ended up being you know a complete disaster mostly because i had no idea what i was doing and there were a lot of experts that actually knew a lot about advertising and a lot about video by that time and i was basically uh, no longer the one my one eyed man among the blind i was you know probably the blind man among a, a sea of people i could see with both eyes and so that actually ended up being a very you know bad outcome because the founder market fit was pretty bad uh and maybe there was scalability of market size but you know i was not the right guy to go after it so then i learned from that i actually my my the third company i started actually went off went after stuff in financial services and uh, we ended up building a relatively successful company that basically then uh, sold a mastercard so my takeaway from my own experience and my life's work if you may is that i think the uh, the founder market fit is probably the most important size of market is very important because that determines how big of a company you can actually build and then uh, the one thing i didn't talk about is that the reason why i think the idea the specific idea itself is less important is at least in my experience i've had to revise the idea that the company was going after many many times till we found success um so it is actually something that we iterated on we listened to the market we learned something from it and we changed something and so we continually refined the idea till we found something that was actually had both size and opportunity um but was still within that the ballpark of something that we were really good at so that's why i think it's a lot more important to find passion which you're going to face a lot of failure so you need to be have the the strength to stick with it in the face of all that failure and passion is very important uh knowledge is very important because you have to be the right guy to go after a girl to go after that particular space and then um you know i think it's it's also important that you're going after a big enough idea okay before i hand over to rakesh a uh, couple of points what he talked about changing directions that's called pivot you know so midstream you said is a oh oh uh, market's moving that way you make a pivot okay the other thing very very important thing apart from assessing what the market and all that is the key thing is the devil is in the execution remember that 
that no matter how good your plans and how good you, the, um, how much money you got and how big a market you opened, if you don't seamlessly execute to the plan, you're not going to make it. Rakesh. Manishi, thank you for inviting me here. And uh, th thank you to everybody here for taking time from a busy uh, weekday evening, family commitments, all of that stuff, right? And sitting in this room. So how many people here are, are actually doing a startup right now? That's quite a good show of hands, Manishi. So I think can I'm... I, I, can I just refine the question? How many of you are doing uh, advanced startups right now? Advanced, that means gone past Series A. Okay, only one. How many of you are early stage startups? Okay, quite a few. And the rest of you, I presume, are wannabes. That means you're planning to jump into a startup. Okay. Okay. So I think the, the you know, Shuark, I've, I've had the good fortune to know for quite a while, as Sanjay as well. So um, I think the, the, I do agree with a lot of, of, of what you said, Shwark. The It's all, you know, the, the founder market fit, because as an investor, um, which I've done more of than, than as, a, as, as a founder, uh, what you're looking for is the passion in the team, right? And uh, whether the team believes in each other. That's, that's, and also, I think there are people who are just a single founder who goes and builds something, something massive. I used to work for a person like that, Jeff Bezos. But uh, in general, you know, there's at least two, three people that are, that are in a team, right? So between, so you very quickly get a sense for, you know, are they just here because it's so cool to do a startup? Uh, or is there a passion for the idea? And I think the idea itself is going to go in so many directions. You know, when we, when, uh, when we started Jungli, it was because my Stanford co-founders Stanford PhD co-founders wanted to uh, license this technology, which they were calling a virtual database, yeah. Oracle database, Jungli virtual database. But now, who the hell knows what a virtual database is, right? So we said we'd build examples. So I suggested we build a large jobs database because job listings are in every employer's website. They used to be in, go to any any big website. There's job there's job postings there, right? So we were able to basically make the web looked like a large database. And we started with one problem. It turned out that nobody had any interest in a virtual database. I mean, th this, this is the type of stuff that, that goes behind people who start to operate stuff. So, but this jobs thing exploded. And then we turned our attention to e-commerce, and at that time we had a larger product, product catalog than Amazon did. Uh, and Bezos wanted us, so, so you know, we jungly became part of Amazon. But, you know, the, if we just sort of, for a while we were pretty obsessed about finding systems integrators and, you know, I, I did a lot of work and figure how to license a virtual database, you know. But it turns out that, that, that it's an important problem because the, the Google was not the Google of today, right? Yahoo search was nothing, right? So there was no really good way to say, ask a question like, I want a sweater, yellow colored of a certain size, how can I get it? or I want a job as an electrical engineer paying $40,000 a year in California. There, there was no way to post queries like that. So we were able to post queries like that. And the value became in the verticals. So that was sort of, you know, you call it a pivot, I suppose, right? Um, also, you know, to what Schwark said, the size of the market is important. So what we're doing right now, uh, we're building this company called whiterabbit.ai. It's a, We've raised a $10 million seed round. So we're, we're very well funded from, 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 from that standpoint. Uh, we've built, uh, so the problem we're going after is, it sounds very noble, right, to uh, save lives and reduce suffering by early detection of cancer. You make tiny movements in uh, catch cancer at stage 2.1 on the average as opposed to 2.2, there's millions of lives that get saved. So radiology, it turns out, doesn't do that great a job because it misses half the cancers. And the false positive rate is an astounding 96%. So it's, it's a ripe problem for AI, right? So, um, and I had a personal encounter, my father passed, but we're looking after him from, 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 
from stage four, basically pancreatic cancer. So clearly the lesson to me was catch it early uh, and you make a huge difference, right? So in a sense, is that the idea? I suppose so. It's a, it's a big enough market. We were fortunate to have uh, Jason Su, who's my co-founder here, is one of the, the, the top AI guys at Stanford, Stanford PhD, who's been working on uh, medical problems. So uh, team is super important. Uh, for this problem we're solving, the data set is very important. So we've got one of the top uh, American medical schools, their entire data set of cancer images and outcomes. So I think, uh, but how are we going to go to market? I think we've figured something out. But you know, who knows if that's going to be the right way, right? And the product, the quote unquote product, you know, think of it as a, as a large set with many, 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 many attributes. Because what is a product? You know, a product is something that satisfies a need, right? And a need is not something you can put into two words. It may require 10,000 words to put. put. So, uh, I mean, I'll give you one quick example, then I'll pass it on to Sanjay. We had a company called SMS Gupshop, which at one point had like 60 million users in India who were exchanging messages, creating groups using SMS. At that time, we were buying the largest amount of SMSs in the country of India. Right? Uh, this was probably 2006, seven, right? Now, the we were so obsessed on SMS and everything it takes to go after SMS that the notion of group messaging for all, right, which is basically WhatsApp, we didn't see that, right. So the idea was right, uh, uh, Manishi, but basically the, the application of the idea, you know, what, what medium you pick and how you go after it is, is equally important, right. And, and what WhatsApp has done has been so obsessively focused on doing just one thing so well, right, and that's, you know, that, that pretty much is everything in terms of, in terms of outcomes. Anyway, let me pass, pass it on. I can keep going. Sanjay, so you, you don't have a mic Well, I'll use Rakesh. Yes, I think he, he brings such a strong pedigree to this that uh, I could probably spend the next hour just listening to him. Uh, I think for, for IT and then I think I'm, you know, for all of you guys who are in you know, interesting technical jobs, I'm assuming finding an idea is not an issue. Right, that's a given. The, ch the question is, if you are going to bet one year, two year, three years of your life, your family's financial security, what makes you believe that that idea is the one that you want to spend that time, right? So to me, the question is not really, do you have an idea? The question is, do you believe strongly in, a f in that idea? What gives you the confidence that this is an idea that you are willing to go take the time to fund it, take the risk? Because start doing a startup really is a risk. I mean, few people are lucky, you know, they get, funding right from the beginning, but uh, in all the companies I've done, I've done the initial work, then got the funding. I think uh, you guys probably went through the same process where you took the risk. Yeah, all the time. Right, so uh, l let me ask the question here. How many people here are doing or have done a startup where no one is paying your salary, you are taking the risk, even if it's for a few months? Okay, so uh, good number. So, so I, I would rephrase the question that I think uh, uh, Monishi started with. It is not a question of, do you have an idea? Question is, how do you get the confidence that this is an idea willing to put your family and your own time at risk? So I think instead of giving you some general bromides around it, let me tell you a little bit more about the Selectica story. I think everyone knows about Selectica. It's a company we started a long time back. Uh, we took it public in 2000. It was by some measure probably one of the biggest IPOs of all time, five billion market cap on day one. But that is not the interesting thing. The thing is, what did it take to get there? So the story starts with uh, me doing research at Xerox PARC. Uh, we were doing work in AI and we were looking at all kinds of things. My own work was around you know, how do you help Xerox design better copiers and printers. Uh, and that work itself uh, did eventually save Xerox billions of dollars, but that's not, that's not important. Along the way, uh, the guys who were running Xerox Canada came, came one time and said, you know, PCs have just come out, and I think most of you guys probably can't relate to this. I mean, you're all used to things that have been very matured, but I was at a time when PCs had actually been announced. They were new things. Uh, and they were selling PCs in Canada, and they were getting 40% error rate in the orders that they were getting. So like, the salesperson brings an order, they build it, they ship it to the customer, and the customer comes back and says, look, you shipped me the wrong thing, it doesn't work. Right? So they're getting 40% error rate. So the question is, why are, they, why are they getting the error rate? Someone either gave the wrong information, or there were some product configuration rules that are not applied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing is, can you guys help to solve the problem? So 
as a researcher, and I was, you know, our job was to understand domain knowledge, you know, capture the knowledge, do a, apply inferencing and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, I started looking at the problem and I spent the next two, three, four years trying to figure out how do you solve the problem of building a quote unquote, a world class configurators that would have all the latest rules and, and, and constraints and could apply that in a short amount of time. And Guarantee basically 100% accuracy. I mean, you know, you can't you can't say I'm going to build you a 737. Oh, but by the way, the the wing is going to drop off. Uh, you know, as you're taking off. I mean, that's not acceptable. You really can't do 99% accuracy is not good enough. You virtually need 100% accuracy. So that's what we're aiming for. So I, I I was so I did the research and I said, okay, I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm done doing research. It's time to do some. You know, start something of my own. I left Park, started a company. And then the question is, I know the technology, and I don't know what the market is. And so I, I went to Gartner and said, okay, what does Gartner talk about? What's important for Salesforce? There is no mention of configuration. You know, they talk about CRM and database marketing, and you know, they, they had their own list of top 10 things. There is no mention of configuration. So at that point, I could either say, well, it's a problem that is not worth solving, but I know firsthand that companies have serious problem in delivering orders accurately. So what, what I did is I hired a market research individual and said, look, why don't you go talk to 10 computer companies, 10 networking companies, 10 medical equipment companies, because these are the companies that are building build to order configurable equipment. And we gave, gave her a whole bunch of questions to ask. And the idea was to figure out, is there a market for, for a technology like this? And she went out, she did a phenomenal job, she was able to find someone in the CIO's office or someone in the, in the finance department or someone in the order entry. And the universal thing was, yes, it's a, if you tell them, do you have a configuration problem, you'll get a blank stare. But if you ask them, are you getting errors in the orders? What is the percentage of errors? How do you solve the problems? Do you have a good handle on it? Do you have a, do you have a vendor that can do that? And the answer universally was, one, we have a problem. Second, we don't know how to solve it. It's a big enough problem. And there is a lot of dollars attached to it because if the order gets shipped wrong, the customer is unhappy. They don't pay you. The word gets out. Other customers don't pay you. So this is a problem that really needs to be solved. And the, and the CFOs are willing to put a lot of money behind this to solve the problem. So I said, okay, now I know there's, I know the technology. I know there's a problem. Let's go build a company. So we built the company. We went out. Now this is early 90s, pre-internet. Uh, so I went to the VCs. I went to more David Dow. And Bill David Dow is considered one of the top marketeers in, in, you know, in Silicon Valley. And uh, he liked what I was doing. And we said, well, I really don't know how big the market is. I said, Bill, I'll help you. I took the SIC code, which is really you know, the, the standard industry code classification, did a sample of the kind of industries where there's a problem. Let's estimate $2 million sales per salesperson. So you can estimate how many salespeople there are, and that comes out to tens of, tens of thousands of salespeople. If you assume $1,000 license price, which is a pretty common thing in those days, it turns into a TAM of about you know, three, four, five billion dollars. And I took it back to, to Bill David Dow, and he said, you know, Sanjay, your, your analysis is very compelling, but in my gut, I don't see this is a problem that is worth solving, and he didn't fund me. So then I went to another guy who was the, who was the Invested at Oracle, um, um, something Lucas. He was he's still, probably still on the board. Uh, very interesting experience. We went there. We walked in. This guy had just come back from Africa. He was still in his breeches. He was, you know, gone, you know, big game hunting. And so we started telling him about configuration. Oh, no, no, Bill Gates just announced uh, plug to play, and they're going to solve the configuration problem. There is no problem. Sorry, uh, I think you're wasting your time. Okay, uh, that's so. Then. Um, Tom Sewell was starting his company, and uh, uh, he heard about what I was doing, and he, uh, so one of the VCs called him as an expert. And Tom said, no big deal, you know, I'm, any engineer at Oracle can solve this problem. End of story. USVP was, was ready to write me a term sheet, basically pulled the funding. Tom calls me the next week and says, you know, Sanjay, I, I heard your presentation, amazing presentation. I'm starting a new company on Salesforce automation. I think we need your technology, can you come and join me? And I said, yeah, you just screwed me there and now you want me to join you. Uh, so I, obviously I'm not gonna do that. But the fact that I had gone through the process of getting my independent validation about how important the problem is, gave me the, the confidence to keep persisting. 
and then the internet came along and suddenly it went it became a problem from something we are empowering the sales people to now every consumer that wants to go to a website and wants to buy something is going to run into a configuration problem because you know all the way from configuring a, a bouquet a flower bouquet to buying a car or a, or a pc or a cisco router all the way up all involves picking making choices and dealing with compatibility or incompatibility and requirement between the choices and literally from 96 to 2000 we basically were on a tier we we were reading accounts vcs are putting money in and uh, 2000 we went public so i think the 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 key lesson in my mind is one you have to have a good idea you have to have the technology either you have it or you're bringing in people in your team and third you need to have the confidence that the problem you're solving actually is worth solving to the big enough market companies are willing to pay and the companies are willing to pay because it is something that is essential for them not not a nice to have and i think if you can if you can nail most of that i think you're on the right path to doing a startup so i'll leave it at that uh, you you covered the area of market research and validation very well uh, shwak do you can you also uh, i mean how do how do you do your market validation and market research so i think uh, the world has uh, changed substantially in the last whatever 5 6 years um, I think validation has become what I what I'll think of as more real time than even a priori research. Um, what I would say to kind of validate your ideas is do the the cheapest thing that you can do to kind of gauge uh, demand. Like you can spend a hundred dollars on AdWords or on Facebook today to kind of get a sense of how many people are actually going to be interested in doing something. So if it's a consumer idea. I think you know you can basically put up a what I'll call a dummy web page to kind of lead people to kind of give you something that that expresses intent or interest to kind of understand what that looks like. It's okay if you piss off a bunch of people, right? You can, you, in fact, I didn't recommend that you take if it's a if it's a it's a product that you actually want people to pay for, go all the way to the point where you actually ask them to put in their credit card because a lot of people say they're interested, but when you actually ask them to pay for it because that's your business model. They won't, and so it's important to kind of validate completely, and and then after you get it, you can tell them, sorry, thank you for your interest. We'll notify you as soon as we're ready. And yes, you'll piss off a bunch of people, but you'll actually get a very very clear sense of what actual demand looks like. If it's in the enterprise world, I think even there you can do a lot of similar kinds of things today, because everybody is going out and looking for things that they care about. So even there, you could do AdWords and stuff like that to kind of put up web pages, you know, forms for further information, call for information, et cetera, et cetera. You could always kind of not respond or call them and say, hey, we're, thank you for your interest. We'll call you back when, when the product's ready. We're not quite ready to ship yet. Um, but there's, there's very cheap ways, I think, of actually kind of assessing demand these days that um, weren't possible 10, 15, 20 years ago, at least when I started my first company. The second thing that I also say is that it's also become far easier to get basic um, uh, software constructs built out. It took me you know, almost a two, three million dollars to put up a data center, a server, and a web page back in 99 when I started my company. You could do that for a dollar today, right? And you can actually do that also. Uh, building software has become extremely uh, economical because there's a lot of components. I mean, building software these days is, uh, closer to building Lego blocks and putting them together rather than actually doing fundamental research, which it used to be 20 years ago. Now, if you are building what I'll call fundamental algorithmic improvements to stuff that you know are you know fundamental research type stuff, then it's a, a completely different domain. But to the extent that you're doing either consumer apps or enterprise apps, in most of these cases, you can actually get the very basic elements of what it is that you're trying to do without you know, having to raise money and spend a bunch of energy to kind of get stuff out. I, I would actually say that the best feedback loops these days are actually live feedback loops. Put this out there, kind of understand what that looks like. There are, uh, look for the closest approximations of what it is that you're trying to do. So search terms, like what are the search volumes of certain kinds of search terms that, you, that would potentially represent demand for your kinds of products? Um, what are the kinds of uh, bid prices for example, what are the, the prices of bids in categories or keywords that you're trying to kind of play in or want to play in? 
all of those are indicators of demand and of, of, of uh, competition. And you know, one of the things I will say on, on that topic is uh, sometimes competition is actually a good, a better mousetrap is much easier to sell than a whole new mousetrap altogether. Like, you know, selling configuration management, nobody knew actually what configuration management is. It's very challenging, it's very hard. But you know, Palo Alto Networks built a better firewall and you know, they, they had a massive business that they could build much, much faster. So to the extent that you can actually build a better mousetrap, it, you know, and in fact you can actually bring something really cool to the, to the market, that's actually a much easier thing to build a, a large revenue line off of faster. Um, but of course, if you can actually create a category, like most companies that have created categories, those are very, very massive exits. But they are much harder to do and take more effort. I have a question there. Shwak, uh, you said you'll do the El Cheapo way of doing a market survey. Now, when you go with that report to a VC, will he take it seriously or would he like to see a nice fat report from Gartner or IDG or one of those big companies? Well, it depends on what uh, space you're in. Uh, I can tell you now, speaking as a VC, I, I do think that, you know, the VCs increasingly are probably less interested in what a Gartner might say. What is more important is, you know, what is the kind of things that actually will sell versus what, what they won't sell. Most VCs that actually invest in these spaces have their own sense of what it is where demand lies and where demand doesn't exist. And so they are less likely to basically go pull up a Gartner report to kind of figure out what, what actually is happening and more likely to call their network that they actually, if they're investing in storage, for example, or they're investing in networking or they're investing in security or investing in enterprise AI like I do. I think we have people that are effectively represent the buying community, if you may. So we're really asking them to understand what demand looks like, to understand what it is that ends up happening. Because by the time Gartner writes about something, at least for early stage venture people like us, it's too late. I mean, we can't be starting or funding a company at that point, which Gartner is already writing about what, you know, as a category. So we are more in the business of yeah, creating Gartner categories in the future rather than, you know, looking for what Gartner says about a certain category. Rakesh? So I think, uh, uh, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, send it to your example, man. The Gartner had no clue about that market. <laughs> so I think if, if you're doing a startup, this uh, market research is bogus, yeah. It, it, it does, it's not going to do a thing for you, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you're starting in a certain domain, then you should get deep, 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 deep knowledge about that domain, whether it's you or getting somebody from, you know, like Sanjay had insane depth and it took him, he was early because there was no internet and many other things weren't there. But uh, I got some names, CB Insight, Pitch Book, Venture. Yeah, so you should go read all those things. I mean, the, the, basically huh. all of this is, is available on the net, right? Uh -huh. So I, I'm not advocating, you know, don't read. And, and be uninformed. But basically, the, the point I'm making is, if somebody tells you that this is a market, which is gonna be this big, and here's this nice chart of, of how it's gonna be, that, if that person was so smart, he would actually go start that business, right? So, uh, I mean, forgive me for just being just totally blunt on that, right? So I think it's, it's of, of, I mean, do a lot of reading, and then do your own thinking, right? And, and sort of the unit test that you can do, right? So I've sat with stopwatches and timed radiologists and stuff like that, right? Basically, you've got to go say, okay, pose a few hypotheses and go out, whether it's using AdWords or how, build a product, see if it works, right? Uh, I think that is far more important than, than basing yourself on, on... Now, that said, there's going to be very mature markets where you can do something like this, right? I mean, AWS has established the fact that this is a... That that is the, the model of the enterprise software company of the future, right? But when uh, uh, when Larry and Sergey put a search box, they, they, that was not in response to any market market research. Or when uh, Jeff said that, you know, when we sold Jungly to Amazon, there was 30 million users of the internet. Right? Now there's what five billion users of smartphones or four billion users of smartphones, right? But I think the there was he was not responding to, to market research. It has to be some intu intuition, mm -hmm. and then validate it, of course. I'm certainly not suggesting be, be stupid, but uh, you can't look at people who, who drive with the rear view mirror and protect the future, right? That's, that's, that's really what I'm saying. Which is not to say don't be uninformed. 
be, be in, be, uh, which is not to say be uninformed. Uh, so that's sort of, I've never used any market research to build, build, build any company. Well, uh, I think, uh, is there anything else you all would like to say? Because that con completes our section one and two. So before we go to section three, I want to open it to the house for any questions. Do we have a spare mic around? Uh, it's okay. I think uh, the channels will be slightly different. So for example, you could do ads on LinkedIn, for example, you could put up a white paper that basically on all these white paper websites to see how many downloads those things get. I mean, it, 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 the construct is similar, the channels might be slightly different, right, to kind of figure out where, you're, you're really trying to find where these people hang out and where they're looking for information and try to see if you can get, you know, how many bites of the apple you can get, so to speak, when you're Put out a bait, if you may. I think one of the I think jungly mics are always better. Uh, I think one of the te te techniques that people use is something like a webinar. If you have some, some interesting content, you basically work with some market research firm, offer up a webinar and see who all shine, sign, signs up, right? That's, they'll give you good, in, good indication of what the demand is for something like that. Uh, I think the other way that people do is what is called content-based marketing. You put out a white paper or something and try to, get, try to get people to download that and you see who's downloading it, what the interest level is. I mean, so those are some of relatively cheaper ways of trying, but you have to put the hard work to put the webinar or the, or the you know, white paper. Okay, okay. okay next question. Yes. I have a couple of questions about the VC side of things, and I think I wanted to focus on the other. Okay. So one is uh, you were talking about the founder, the co-founder looking ahead. Can I have a microphone? We can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. We use a microphone. Introduce yourself. What, what, by the way, what's your name? Uh, Sandal. Which IIT? Okay. 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 I'm Nirmala from IITM. Um, so one question about you were. Nirmala from IATM. Um, so, <laughs> I don't think we've changed the name yet. Um, so, uh, about the founders, you were talking about the vision, the, the, the path ahead, looking forward and driving, right? Uh, do generally VCs also go with their gut or intuition? And the second part of the question is, uh, when I'm a co-founder and I'm doing this concept to business, to prototype, to market, what's the right time to actually approach a VC? And how much information should I provide? But, uh, I think you're asking, um, one question was, are VCs like founders in that, do they look ahead as well, right? That was one question. And the second is the timing of approaching a VC, right? So I think, uh, you know, anybody that's certainly VCs are looking ahead. I mean, their whole business is based on that, right? So I think that you can take it as a, as, as, as a given. Which is not to say that, that VCs don't, I think VCs have an enormous herd mentality. So N companies get funded of a certain type, that N is gonna grow for, for, for quite a while on just on the momentum of the ones that have been funded before that, right? Uh, so time to go to a VC is, uh, and I think you should, you, we should get Schwartz's answer on that, but my take is that the first people that are going to fund you are people that, that uh, are what are broadly called angels, right? Uh, because a VC in, is actually a fiduciary, right? In, in a, I'm certainly a fiduciary to my wife and daughter's bank accounts, right? But 
not in quite the same way as Schwark is a fiduciary to, to, the, to, the, to the limited partners that have invested in this. So they're going to be inherently a little bit more risk averse so that your first checks are much more likely to come from family, friends, Sanjay Mittal, you know. <laughs> so, and, and I think you go to VCs once, once, you've, once you've got, uh, they're going to ask you a lot of questions. So, so a big part of going to a VC is that uh, I think it's not just the presentation you go with, right? It's, you've got to be prepared to be, uh, really go into, into deep areas where you might not have delved before, right? So, uh, and some, some things you're not going to know unless you build a product and try it, right? So I think once, you've, once you're in a position that you can actually answer to, even to yourself, uh, you know, in a credible way, what the what the questions are. That I think that's sort of a, a tipping point. And certainly, if you've got any scalability, if you can show a chart that goes like this, every VC is going to go in uh, in a big market, right? And and say, wow, that's that's very cool. So let me give give it to Shwar. Um, I, I'll I'll just add a little bit more color. I think what Rakesh said is exactly that. But I think when you think about VC, right, one of the things is it's a very broad and overloaded term, so to speak. Uh, I think what you mean is investors. And uh, uh, VCs are actually one specific class of investors, right? So uh, typically, you start with angel money. Then you go to what's called seed funds that basically will give you seed money. And then you typically then go to a Series A firm, then a Series B firm, a Series C firm. So these A, B, C, and D firms generally all collectively, you know, you call venture capitalists or VCs, right? But before you get to the first VC, which is a Series A firm, uh, we do Series A and Series B as an example. That's our sweet spot. We don't do Cs, we don't do Ds, and we very rarely do Cs. So we do, we do, do some Cs, but very rarely. Um, Cherry in, in the back there actually is uh, one, of our, one of the seed funds we tend to work with. So I think, uh, so there are folks that effectively focus on different stages. And what I will tell you is, when I started my first company in 99, when Rakesh wrote that check, um, we didn't have anything. I mean, we had, a, we, had, we had three guys and an idea of what we wanted to do, and I think we may have written one or ten lines of pearl to show that it can be done somewhat, right? But we really didn't have anything. We didn't even have much of a deck or anything. But Rakesh said, hey, these guys seem smart enough to go figure something out. Here's, here's you know, I don't remember how much you wrote, but like, he, he wrote us a check to basically say, go, go, go make sure that you can actually show that this thing can be done. And we got like 10 other people to do that, and we raised a million or $2 million. Uh, today, most people that are going to angels usually have software running. They usually have some customers. They have, they have, because building software has become so cheap and so easy that if you don't have that, you know, even the angel is looking at you and saying, wait, every other guy that's coming to me has a basic stuff all figured out. How come you're coming to me? So what defines the boundaries of each of those layers evolves with time, right? I mean, today you can build entire machine learning flows using TensorFlow and so on if you have a good data set. But before TensorFlow was open source, that took a lot of work to get there, right? So in every, in every area, uh, getting that, that first step has become so democratized. I think it becomes the, the expectations at every layer are becoming higher and higher. So typically, for a Series A, as an example, we tend to see, this is not a hard and fast rule, so it's not like you can never get funded as a Series A if you don't hit this, but we're typically seeing people that are doing about a million dollars of recurring revenue, right? So that's roughly the time, give or take, that we tend to see people coming for a Series A. Um, and increasingly, the amounts being raised is also growing, right? So like, uh, at one point, our angel rounds used to be 100, 200, 300K with people writing 10, 20K checks. Uh, today, the angel rounds are going up to a million, so on and so forth. Seed rounds are going up to two or three million. He raised a $10 million seed round. So you, know, you can see that there's, a, there's a, a, an ex expansion of what it means to stay at each of these layers because the investors each of these layers are actually starting to put more and more money to work. And uh, so that basically means that what used to be a Series A is now a seed round, and what used to be a Series B is now a Series A, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, adding to that, is there any watering? Is there any watering hole where VCs hang out where we can build relationships before we talk to them about a project? So, I, I, the Madras startup club. <laughs> <laughs> so 
<laughs> yeah, Rakesh, go ahead. Just very quickly, I think, you know, what Schwag said actually s struck something, right? Basically, when, when we started Jungli, it was all based on PowerPoint, yeah. And I think for the first several companies that have been involved in starting or even funding, they were, these were PowerPoint startups, yeah. There's no such thing anymore, you know? With, with AWS and the fact that you can just, and to even write code, we have to get an Oracle license and, you know, buy freaking Sun servers and right. stuff like that, right? So if you've got such a barrier, you know, it's remarkable that any startups are ever funded, right? And right now the expectation is that somebody's gonna come in and show you, you know, a product with, you know, good, good, good functioning, whether that's got revenue or not is a different story. But you, the days of PowerPoint have shifted to the days of, uh, of, uh, of Java, or it's just, it has to be, you can't write in PowerPoint anymore. You have, <laughs> you have to write in, in, in whatever, whatever your, your, your language. It has to be a product by the time it gets to VC. It's a big, it's a big shift. And I think it plays very well to the strength of the people in this room, by the way. Right. So the, the, no, I know because uh, a few years ago, I invested in the gaming industry, and I went to some club in San Francisco. They, they meet there every Wednesday. It's run by an Indian lady. And all these young kids would come around and say, Psh, I got this, Psh, and he'll show me that thing on his tablet. You know? And I didn't know a thing about the gaming industry, but my partner dragged me into putting money in there. But anyway, uh, so they were all showing something. You know? Now, how real it is, I had no clue because, you know, I was looking at a completely different market. It's the migration market from console to tablet to the phone. And the channels are on Android and iOS. And the entire migration, I said, hey, there's going to be a lot of money in this. But when my partner told me, you know what, we should build the games, I said, are you kidding? Can you make out the mindset of a 15-year-old? I mean, the biggest population, is, you know, it's like this. The younger the people, the more the number of people who play games. And somebody told me, don't ever hire a guy who's over the age of 25 in the gaming company. Well, he will not figure out a damn thing. I said, you bet, I can't figure out anything <laughs> at all. So, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing anything which is consumer and user-oriented, you get a, you got to get a really good gut feel as to how is the market thinking, because of which uh, I'm an advisor to the IIT Madras Research Park, and I have not been able to contribute to them in terms of the U.S. market. And I said, you know, you guys don't get it. The, the market here is like this. You put some colors over there, and you think it's, oh, this is very aesthetic. But in America, they think a different set of colors are more aesthetic. Now, you know, the, the word for this is, what is cool, you know? Everybody uses the word cool. What the hell is cool, you know? So this is something... India doesn't get what the U.S. is thinking. So predominantly, most we've launched about 100 companies out of IIT Madras research parks, all focused on the Indian market. They are not focused on the U.S. market. Okay. And Sanjay, anything else to add? Uh, shifting the topic a little bit, I think one of the uh, now focusing primarily on the enterprise side. I think a, a big shift that's happened in the last uh, you know 10, 15 years is this focus on you know software as a service and going after sort of recurring revenue and so on. And I was talking to a few startups who are beginning to sort of react to that. What they're finding is that the enterprises are actually becoming very, very sensitized to how VCs fund startups. So they're realizing that for an for a for a enterprise to give a, a project to a young software company, they're actually in the, in the driver's seat because they know that by their very act of giving uh, you know early contract to a startup, they're probably enabling them to get funding from a VC because the VC are going to say, okay, do you have one, two, three, four, five customers? You know, what's your I MRR and IRR and all that all that kind of stuff. And the 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 problem that's creating for the startups is that you're now negotiating not on the value that you're providing to the to the to the enterprise. You're being negotiated on the value the enterprise providing to you as a startup so that you can go raise your funding, right? So the insight that this guy had is the old way where we used to do things where we'd go out and try to sell large licensing deals was a much better deal because that was being sold on the value of the software as opposed to the perceived value that they thought that uh, the, the starters are getting. So I mean, I'm actually, I'm, I'm curious what uh, the VCs are seeing on this, but I've now talked to th three or four startups recently and they're all saying that, you know, this whole SaaS thing, it works for a few small companies like maybe, you know, um, 
uh, you know, the, um, like, uh, um, what's, the, what's the company that is doing this, uh, um, you know, the, the help desk kind of thing where uh, people are collaborating. Um, Slack, right. So a few companies like Slack are actually doing very well, but most other companies, like there's a company called uh, a Slide Desk. Uh, uh, they were basically providing, a, you know, a, a, your, uh, your PowerPoint deck that you could put on the web and then you could track the analytics and so on and there is a lot of money and they're doing very, not Slides, it's another company. Uh, but uh, after raising $100 million, they went under because they found that they just could not get enough money on this, on the SaaS basis. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, what, what Trinity guys are seeing. You know, is there a shift going back towards maybe it makes a lot more sense to go for license deals as opposed to this, uh, you know, small amount of uh, SaaS deals? So, um, so no, I think, uh, if anything, the, the, the trend seems to be moving away from these large, long sales cycle, enterprise sales type uh, outcomes, which are big, bulky outcomes, but actually end up becoming significantly uh, longer sales cycles, to actually more of this, what I'll call bottoms up sales. They may actually end up with these seven figure licenses and so on and so forth, but they're actually being bought ideally by individuals that start to get a single person starting to use something uh, 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 a small group in the company starting to use something and then expanding, so to speak. This more of a, a land and expand type thing where the sales process actually is a little bit more organic, where it looks a little bit like Slack did that thing, Yammer did it, and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of folks that have actually uh, somewhat made that sales process into a, into a, uh, a methodology. And th if anything, companies that are doing that seem to be more preferred um, because of their shorter sales cycles than necessarily somebody that can actually put a whole bunch of logos up there. Right, no, I think the, the point I was making is, yes, that, that is what we're all being taught in the last 10, 15 years. But I'm, what I'm hearing from the startups is that they are seeing that that model is actually not working for other than a few select number of companies. Basically what their experience is, you better go sell high in the organization, establish the value, and that's only we're going to get a lasting relationship. This whole thing about, one guy in the company buying it and that's slowly escalating into 10 buying and then 50 buying. It might work for a few companies, it is just not working for enough companies. So I will tell you that at least in our portfolio, we'll see for all, we do a lot of developer ops type stuff, like uh, software bought by the engineering and the operations groups. It works very well, in fact it works the best when it actually happens that way. Um, but if you think about, like we have an MPLS company, for example, there it doesn't work that way. Right? So you have to sell into the top, you have to go to the CIO, for example, and sell them the MPLS line replacement and so on and so forth. But for, there are certain kinds of things where that's probably true, but in the bulk of the things that we are like looking at, we have uh, marketing SaaS, sales SaaS companies, in a lot of those scenarios, we still see this bottoms up model working relatively well. If not bottoms up, it's definitely not like top down where you're effectively going and selling to the CEO and saying, here's a $4 million license for the whole company. The, there's a, I think there's two other models, which are both are very, very interesting. One is open source, and the other is uh, uh, be, the, com be the, the company you want to disrupt, right? So it's, like Amazon never licensed uh, e-commerce software, right? Uh, and uh, we're investors in a company called H2O.ai, which is a big machine learning platform. And it's, it's open source, but the data science community is, is finite, right? So if, if you've got 100,000 people in, in data scientists that are using it, then you've got a path to uh, somebody who's doing analytics now is, is, has straight access to the C-suite, right? So I think there's just, it's, even the ways to, 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 to attack software, uh, you know, Uber is a software company, right? But it's, it's, it's not licensing transportation software. So it's, it's, it's become the, the industry that it wants to disrupt because software is the engine to disrupt the, those industries. And I think these are just enterprise software companies which, since they're full stack, they get to the consumer. So would it be correct to say that uh, if you develop something on open source, and it has a big enough traction in the market, you might get acquired. Like let's say R, the language R, there was a company called Revolution Analytics uh, that built that and they got bought over by Microsoft. And you know, it was an open source platform. You paid, I mean, you didn't pay for it. Like, 
Okay, next question. Anybody? Here. Uh, let me give the mic to you guys, you know, because not everybody can hear you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Uday Kiran Chhaka and uh, IIT Delhi. A question that I got uh, quite often is that uh, the space you are in seems to be quite crowded. And so how do you like respond to that? How do you uh, get the initial interest so that you can uh, show that your solution is distinct enough to be funded? Uh, so what are your thoughts on that, the crowded comment here? So I think some markets are crowded and worth staying away from. I mean, they're, they're truly crowded, namely, you know, you're probably aiming to be the 20th provider, and then the top 19 are probably well established, so I think it's good to stay away from that. Uh, on the other hand, so here is my take on, on uh, you know, on one hand, software is cheap, the, 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 the software stack is cheap, but there is still value in finding the right algorithm for some problems. Not every problem needs a good algorithm, but some problems do require the right algorithm, so there are probably one good algorithm and 20 bad ones. So if you're going to a crowded market and you think you really have a better mousetrap, which could really give you, you know, improve the performance or reduce the cost or something compared to the competition, by all means go for it. But you need to, you need to have a pretty clear sense of what your competitive advantage is going to be. What I'll say is that, you know, uh, crowded spaces, sometimes happen to be some of the best spaces because there is clearly market demand there, so that actually, space being crowded is actually evidence of market demand. The thing I will say there though is that far too often we see companies that are basically 10% better than the crowd of market, the, the crowd of competitors that are out there, and yes, they are better, but 10% better in a crowded market is just not enough, right? So you have to be close to 100x better and if you can actually show that you're 100x better in a crowded market space, that's actually a great place to be because, you know, I had mentioned like Palo Alto Networks before, right? So it's like, yeah, the firewall market is very, very crowded, but they just simply had a, a substantially better firewall than anything else that was out there that addressed the needs of that current generation of threats, right? And so, and so people were buying firewalls, so they just simply went in there and said, like, I have a 100x better firewall than anything else you can buy and they very quickly kind of built a very large business doing that. But if you have a system that says, hey, you know, my machine learning algorithm is 10% better than all these other guys that are doing it, just not enough, right? I think it's also do, some, do something differently, right? Because a market may be crowded, but nobody's done a product exactly the way you've done it, and there's something about the way you've done it that's going to attract a lot of people, right? I'll say Slack and Yammer. So, uh, Slack was so different than, it's a very crowded space. You know, but that doesn't mean that you can't, uh, I totally agree with you. If, if a space is not crowded, which means there's no interest there, right? So uh, I think it's worth continuing the dialogue and uh, either getting convinced that, you know, you're doing just something very me too, which may be 10% better, or you have a way in a crowded space to do something completely different. The, the different dimension could be across business model, it could be across product, it could be across your method of getting financing, so many different things, right? The, so I, I just go back to my first point, which a product is, is, a, is a something with many attributes. So if you can find a way of differentiating it in a way that the market's gonna respond, then crowded spaces are, are, are a blessing. Um, I think it's really more about the perspective that the entrepreneur brings to that particular market, right? So it, it's uh, it's literally about, literally about the vision that they can uh, expound, if you may, of what the space is, what the opportunity is. And like um, we met a founder recently that's I think three years out of college, uh, trying to build something in the financial services space, and. Uh, uh, someone that's whatever three years out of college clearly has no real perspective on financial services per se but this particular gentleman then ended up having a very very deep level of understanding and perspective on what the opportunity was what the, what the uh, challenges were 
and they clearly understood that space very deeply. How they got there, I don't know, right? Like they might have just spent a year just studying the entire space and getting really, really deep into it. But they had a command over that space in a way that I haven't seen in people that have had 10 years of experience in the space, right? So I don't think it's, it's a function of age or time or whatever else. It's really a question of do you have a depth of uh, knowledge and perception and vision of what the opportunities are, what the challenges are, what the competition looks like, what the space looks like, and what it takes to succeed. And, uh, and as I mentioned, like, you know, whatever you start out with, you're more than likely going to evolve from. It'll, it'll change. And so plotting those changes, you could just keep trying randomly different things, but someone that actually understands the space very, very deeply is able to take the insights from what they're seeing from the market and then plot the next course a lot more effectively than someone that's, you know, what I'll call a tourist, right? So where they're basically coming in, they're trying something, it didn't work, they'll try something else, that didn't work, they'll try something else, right? So I think that depth of knowledge and an understanding and that, that visionary insight into where the opportunity or what the challenges are in the space that you play in, I think is what will define that. that will cannibalize the primary product of the company. And I heard years ago, Cisco used to have a bar of 50 million. That if your company, I mean, if your idea requires an inve investment of less than 50 million, we are not interested. So many of the guys from Cisco would go out, start the company, and then come back and sell it back to Cisco, what Spin Out, Spin In, they used to call it. Because I think Cisco has done quite a few times in the past. So I'm just saying, Hi, uh, my name is Rishab Chada. I am from IIT Delhi. Uh, so all of you have started many, uh, many successful companies. So I want to kind of understand the thought you had when you were starting your first company. And the question that I have is that, uh, you know, let's say you have two options. One of them is a smaller TAM. So the total size of the market is not very big, let's say a million dollars, versus something that, you know, you see more potential in $10 million, uh, something bigger. But the one which is smaller actually has, it's more deterministic. I, uh, you know that, you know, you can uh, go after that market and actually make a mark, get uh, revenue flowing. Versus the other idea which is bigger potentially, but uh, there's more risk and lesser certainty. So which one would you go for uh, and suggest going for? So keep in mind that if you go to VC and you say your time is 1 million, I don't uh, know I, no. Or 10 million, or, or 100 million, let's say 100 million. million. It's 100 million, most VCs will probably say, thank you very much, come back when you have a bigger time, okay? So most VCs are not interested. In reality, what happens is not the story, but when you go there, you better be thinking in terms of very large time, because they know that when everything's said and done, you'll probably only get a fraction of it and all that kind of stuff. So if the time is small and deterministic, it's a great consulting business. Go start a consulting company, go make money in it, and live on the, on the profits. If you want to go for a venture-funded company where you're expecting other people to put money and take the risk, the market has to be big enough for them to think it's worth taking the risk because they also know that you know five out of six or nine out of ten or some some large number is going to fail. So they be, you know they have to believe that yours is the one the one that's going to succeed.
Uh, okay, in that case, uh, what happens is the VC has a certain expectation, and Naeem will tell you the numbers. It's like in a span of about, say, five years, they would expect five to eight X of the money that they put in as a return. So when you start contemplating a project, you're going to say, can I return that kind of money? I'm borrowing a million dollars, then I need to send back five million or eight million within this span of time. Now, the, these, these multipliers vary from project to project, from VC to VC, and the kind of market they are in. And also, it has something to do with the life cycle of the particular fund that the VC is running at that point of time. If that fund is running out, your runway is not very long. You know, within a very short time, you have to return. I think, Swak, you'd be able to better clarify that. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, it's a lot simpler than you think. Um, most VCs have LPs, which are basically their VCs, right? So their L we call them our LPs, limited partners, that they actually give us money that we then invest in, in companies. Um, and you can take a fund like ours. We are a $400 million fund. Most Series A, Series B funds are somewhere in that range, three, $400 million funds. We need to return to our LPs at least a 3x, right? Anything more than a 3x is, 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 is better, but at least a 3x we want to return. So on a $400 million fund, that basically means we need to return $1.2 billion, right? So if you need to return $1.2 billion, and like Manishi said, we're going to have two out of 10 companies that are going to drive most of the returns, right? So we have, you know, let's say we make 20 investments out of this $400 million fund. We expect three of them to basically return the $1.2 billion. Each of those three basically needs to return, call it $400 million on average, right? Uh, maybe let's call it f f uh, four companies or five companies. Let's say each company needs to return about $200, $200, $200 million each company that succeeds. Um, to return the fund at 1.2 billion. Uh, we typically own, call it 20% of the company. It's usually less than 20% of the company, but let's say we own somewhere in the range of 20% of the company when they actually go to their exit, right? That basically means each of those companies that succeeds needs to be a billion dollar outcome. So our 20% is worth $200 million, right? And remember, we typically don't own 20 million, 20 percent when the company actually goes public. Even though that's what we go in with, it'll get diluted down a little bit usually in later rounds. So we're probably owning like 16 percent. So really looking for companies that actually can go to a billion dollar outcome. Now, we just don't know which of those, which of these 20 companies the five are going to end up as. So every one of those 20 companies needs to be a candidate to be a billion dollar outcome, so we can get a 200 million dollar outcome. Uh, $200 million return, which can then return the fund at the bare minimum of a 3x, right? So if you kind of keep that in mind, that's actually to Sanjay's point of why when you go in and say, hey, I have a TAM of 10 million, we're like, it's not even worth spending any time on this at all, right? Because if the TAM is 10 million, there's no way the company is going to be worth a billion. Right? So the, if the company were worth be a billion dollars, you need to be driving revenues in the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue to have the, with the multiples be worth a billion dollars in corporate value. So if you just remember that general rule, you will understand exactly why VCs or what VCs are looking for or what it is that it, they, irrespective of whether or not you have a path to a billion dollars, there needs to be the hope of this company actually returning a billion dollars of corporate out. Roughly, I'm give, using a, a, a rough number for a fund about three, four hundred million dollars, right? So now if you go to a, an angel who is putting $20,000, for them a $10 million aqua hire is still very interesting because they're putting in money at whatever, like a 200, $200 million, 200K valuation. And if you got bought for $10 million, they just whatever, 10X their money and they lose some of their money, et cetera, et cetera. That still works out. Um, similarly, if you go to a seed fund, which is a $40 million fund, for them, having a $200 million outcome, which is actually much easier to do, the, the chance of outcomes is an exponential curve, so to speak. So getting a $10 million outcome is very easy. Getting a $60 million outcome is exponentially harder than that. Getting to a $100 million outcome is exponentially harder than that. And getting to a billion dollar outcome is doubly exponentially harder than that. So at every level for an investor, 
uh, it becomes easier and easier to justify an investment. So as you go farther and farther, if you go to a Series A, Series B firm, uh, the bar is higher. They will not look at it unless it's a billion dollars. But an angel will look at it if it is not a billion dollar outcome. A seed fund may also be looking at it and saying, oh, if I get a $200 million outcome, that's a pretty good outcome. Whereas if a venture firm invests in a company they think could be a $200 million outcome, we'd be out of business because if that's the upside, the, the average scenario net of all of the losses and everything else we end up coming at will actually not return the fund. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. So uh, the math is right, right? Is there, a, is there room for a Series A, Series B fund? And the reason I'm asking this question is, as an angel, if I write a 100K check and that becomes a million dollars, I'm very happy, mm -hmm. right? Okay. But that means it was very subscale exactly. for a Series A, Series B, right? Exactly. But when you take Series A, Series B risks, you still have the same thing. The chance of a company becoming a billion is low, right? However, if you do a Series C, Series D check, I mean, you go from seed to, to growth, right? Yeah. Because if a company's already got a certain re 100 million revenue, it's already worth a billion, yeah. then you can say, okay, this is gonna become five billion or 10 billion, right? You've got a much better, you, you've got a much better seat at the table right. to figure that second stage out, right? Yeah. So to me, it almost looks like at the seed stage, you know, very small funds, personal funds or yeah. something which, which are, let's say 10 to 50 million are low risk. C's, A, Series B are pretty high risk. Right. And then put the money in CD, funds where, where you're seeing the, 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 the traction, right? So, so you, do, you guys do great work, but it, it takes a, so what Spark is talking about, it takes a lot of vision and, and, and thought process to actually do a Series A, Series B type of fund. Yeah, um, actually it is, Series A, Series B is probably the hardest yeah. um, segment to actually invest in, to your point, because returns are fewer, fewer and far in between, but they need to be significantly higher. But they're also the funds that actually have the best returns. So when you go to a Series C, Series D fund, if you're an LP, if you have a spare $20 million lying around, putting it in a Series C, Series B, Series D fund will give you a return that you know, nets out in the 2.5 to 3x range. That's kind of where they end up. It's a much lower, uh, higher probability because most, most of the deals they do are going to end up somewhere in that range. So their, their failures that they're accounting for are much less. So they're typically investing in sure shots or, as close, or what they think are sure shots. They still have failures even at that stage. But they're far fewer. But you, you very rarely get Uber-style outcomes that basically end up giving you fund return type things. Like Uber, for example, returned the fund many times over for benchmark, as an example. Right? I, I, I guess a question is return per unit of risk, right? Yes. So, so that's what I'm asking, series A, series B versus it, it is very true. Like, you know, it is, a, it is a tough segment of the thing, but the returns make it an attractive thing for LPs, and that's kind of why we're in that business. Okay, uh, let me just uh, add to this. If you don't understand this ABCD and all this sort of stuff, please attend the next two sessions because Naeem will cover that in depth. There is one other class of investor at the very, very early stage. It's called friends, family, and fools. <laughs> friends and family, you understand. Fools are guys like me. Uh, I've always been in the service business and we have a very good lifestyle and you make a decent amount of money and because I feel very irrelevant in Silicon Valley against all these product guys, I feel like a worm in front of them. To make my relevance felt, I used to chip in $50,000, $100,000 per pop for each startup. Not for any other reason, I didn't care. I mean, like I did care, but I mean, I lost in most of the cases, but you know what, the word got around, hey, Munishi, invest. You must be a great guy. I say, that's about all, you know, sort of ego satisfaction. And not only guys who are, let's say, out of the market like service business, but also old guys, you know, you go and catch some old guy, you know, he's saying, how do I get myself, uh, you know, relevant in Silicon Valley, you know? Let's give this guy 50,000 bucks. Who gets it out? Ah, he gave 50,000 bucks. <laughs> okay, okay, next question. Now, somebody took the mic from me. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to take, take, carry on the point from there. Uh, if, say, you're building a fundamental technology uh, and you have one market, which is, say, a $50 million market, which applies to another market, which is, say, a $10 billion uh, market, you, is it okay if you first pursue the $50 million market because you have business connects or whatever there and then go to the bigger market? Or as a VC, would you directly need validation for the $10 billion market? 
No, I think it, uh, the staging of, of demand is perfectly a logical way of doing it. So if you actually have a $50 million market where you can actually do something and actually show traction, that, that makes perfect sense. The, the key question that I would ask if you came with a pitch like that is to say, like, how similar are those two markets? Like, is it quite likely that you will nail the $50 million market and completely you know, blow the $10 billion market because the products or the technologies actually needed to attack those two markets are not as similar as you think they are, but they're actually very different, right? And that's the key question, but you know, to the extent that it's the exact same product or the exact same infrastructure that needs to be applied, it, it perfectly is legitimate to kind of go after a market that makes sense. But all that said, I would tell you to basically say, and this comes back to, I think at some point we want to talk about team, I'd say like if there is a $10 billion market and a $50 million market where you have contacts in 50 and not in the 10, uh, in the 10 billion, I'd say go find a co-founder that can actually get you into those $10 billion markets. So why waste your time on the $50 million market? Because every day you spend in your startup uh, that you're not working towards the big outcome is burn and therefore dilution and everything else to you on an ongoing basis, right? So it's, it, I would advise you to not go out, even if you did have those contacts, if there's a 10 billion and a $50 million market, say like, go find a guy that can get you into that $10 billion market, go as a, as a team to go after that market. Next question. Uh, hi, Madhuri from uh, IIT Kharagpur. Another question about- Jaipur, did you say? Kharagpur. <laughs> Kharagpur. <Yeah. laughs> I have a question about market research. One of the things that Bipul mentioned during the previous session was that in order to differentiate from talkers from walkers, he asked them to sign a 3K deal to get in the pipeline for a pilot for the product when the product is going to come out six months later. So my question to you is, have, you, have any of you used that model to differentiate uh, potential customers from serious prot potential customers versus potential customers that are just curious and they'll end up wasting your time? Um, I, I think the construct of a paid pilot is a, is a proven way of, of filtering your pipeline to make sure that you actually know exactly who is a real customer and who has budgets and priorities. When you offer something up for free, um, you don't have enough commitment from the other side to actually go follow through on it. So they might do the free pilot, but they may not have, like remember most large companies are not uh, uniform entities. They're just a collection of a whole bunch of people. There could be a junior guy that wants to learn something about this particular space. They'll say, oh yeah, free pilot, let's go do it. I mean, and you can say I have a, a pilot going on with Shell, but it happens that Shell actually is not doing the pilot. You know, Joe is doing the pilot, right? And Joe doesn't have any purchasing authority. But if you make it a paid pilot, you suddenly filter out all the Joes that don't have purchasing authority. And suddenly you're only talking to the person, someone that actually can make a purchase, right? And, um, and how you structure those pilots also makes a big difference, right? So. Sorry, I was confused. So people said that ask for a small amount of money and then you can If you can swing it, go for it. I don't think you can. <laughs> okay, I will take one more question. And uh, no, it's not that the other questions won't be answered. I want to finish the next section on uh, team building, and then we'll come back again to Q and A. And then any residual questions, even attached to this one, can be covered at that time. You did you? Want to, uh, yeah. I'm Actually, Bobby. wait, you're from Washington. You're from the Washington, D.C. area. Why are you asking a question? Bye. This is only meant for Silicon Valley. I'm a regulator. <laughs> There's Bob Nathan. Hey. Hey. Yeah, so. Thanks, Moishi. You know, yeah, I'm Bob Nathan from IIT Madras. I'm in the service business, uh, catering to government services, solutions. But I'm contemplating helping a, a young startup. Uh, in the IoT industry. Anyway, uh, my question is, uh, in your outline, 2.3, barriers to entry. I think you've covered it in all of your analysis. Assuming I have a great idea, great passion, great market, you know, the secret sauce to everything, what are my barriers, barriers to entry? 
I'm not sure I understood the question. Could you repeat the question? How do you build the annual strength? Yeah. Or what the other uh, uh, the, the, the uh, the yeah, sure. Uh, in the outline, 2.3 is barriers to entry. You know, we can have a great product, right? And this day of high compet uh, competitiveness and great minds doing the same thing, people with a lot of organization, heels, success, etc. Big companies swallowing small ideas. What are the barriers to entry? You know, spe specifically, I start up something, I have not much money. How do I protect my IP and being swallowed up and crushed? How do you build barriers to entry? So, I mean, there, there are all the classical things, right? You can, have, you can have technology barrier, you can have process barrier, you can have execution barrier, right? You could have relationship barrier. So there are multiple ways that you could build those barriers. But I think before you worry about a barrier, the question is, do you even have a solution that is going to give you an edge in the marketplace, right? That's the first thing you're going to start with. It's too early to worry about a barrier if you don't even have the right solution, right? So, I mean, if you're worrying about the barrier before you even deliver a solution, I think you're putting the cart before the horse. Let me add to that. So, if you have an idea which is unique, I mean, your danger is, let's say, you've got a three-man team or a five-man team developing something. Infosys, at any time, at any time, has 10,000 people on the bench. That means idle between projects because they have a team strength of over 100,000 people and 10% is typically on the bench. They're going to easily throw in 500 people and they'll make your product overnight. Yes or no? Not likely. If you've got a unique idea, a unique algorithm, they could have 500 or 5,000 general purpose people. They wouldn't have a clue about how to attack you if your idea is that unique. So that is one solution, but let me. Sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, so I think your main barrier is whether you're, you've got customers that, that love your product. Yeah. So if you can generate, just focus on your customer. That's the main thing. Forget about competition, everything else. If you, if you can obsessively focus on your, on, on your customer and they love your product, you know, that's all the barrier you need. Just, just that understand your customer, satisfy their need, make them fall in love with your product, and um, that's pretty much all the wisdom that you need here. Well, I, I, I'll give you one uh, thematic thing that I think w we have seen be a very consistent strength in a barrier to entry, which is some kind of network effect, which is uh, every customer that joins your product or starts using your product effectively makes the product better for everybody else. So when you have that kind of a, a construct, whether that can happen because of data, it can happen because of um, a marketplace, it can happen for whatever kind of construct. Uh, in those scenarios, it becomes very hard for even an incumbent to kind of, once you start to show the way, to kind of jump into it and say, I'm going to do that instead. Um, and so uh, those, f trying to build some kind of a, a network effect that effectively makes your product stronger as you kind of build usage into it is oftentimes a really good way of building a strong barrier to entry. Okay, let's go to the next part, which is on team building. Now, uh, you know, uh, basically how, how do you first and foremost select your fellow co-founders? Then next is building the core team and third is the kind of advisors you bring on board. Advisors can be very useful because they can give you tremendous connections and relationships where if you try to get a full-time person, it would be too costly. And certain parts of your product, you may outsource it to a vendor. And uh, it may be temporary in nature. That means you're doing something. It will just last for about three months after that. You don't need it you may want to use contractors or outsource it to a vendor. Of course, I know a very unique case. Um, I think you guys know Anand Jagannathan of IIT Kanpur. He outsourced a portion of his work, I mean, a significant amount of his work to Persistent in India. So I said, why didn't you set up your own thing? He said, because if my competition finds out that that is my 
offshore development center, they'll go there and clean up all my people and that's it, I'm dead. Whereas if they are in persistent, which has got 2,000 people, they wouldn't know which six belong to me. So they'll never be able to swipe my guys. <laughs> They're just as a, they say, anyway, uh, Shwark, about team building, your views, please. So uh, I, I will tell you of everything that we talked about today, this I think is probably the most important, uh, where I would focus my energies if I were in your shoes, is building your team. Um, of everything I've done, I think the thing that has defined the scale and, and uh, degree of success had a lot to do with the team. And I'm, I'm defining team very broadly. I actually include investors and people around the company into that, into that equation. But your co-founding team is a very, very key part of what I think will define success. The most common thing that I see in teams that I've advised or invested in is that people tend to surround themselves with people like themselves. So IIT engineers working with other IIT engineers to kind of go after different opportunities. And the most successful teams, I think, are actually the most complementary teams, people that actually have um, a very strong set of complementarity, um, but at the same time are able to get along. Because the other thing that tends to happen a lot, and it happens far more often than you think, is founders not getting along with one another. Uh, you will end up spending more time with your co-founder than you will with your wife or husband. And so you need to kind of understand that that's going to be a, a very key part of your life for the next seven, 10 years. And you need to be able to kind of make sure that you're able to get along with them. Um, but more important than that, I think, is the complementarity, that you actually have the people in the team that are the, the, the best complement to what you need to actually go after the opportunity that you're going after. So we talked about before about you know, going after that $10 billion market. Um, you know, in that case, you know, somebody that actually comes from that market is probably the best complementarity to you that actually has the best technical product solution for that space, for example. So making sure complementarity is uh, going to make sure that your team is most likely to succeed against all the other teams that are going to go after that, that particular space. Um, uh, in fact, one of the things that I learned the, t the really tough way, thankfully by not making a mistake, is in my first company, which Rakesh actually invested in, um, we were three IIT, actually two IIT guys and one other engineer who was not IIT, but he was still an engineer. That was the team that Rakesh put money into. There was three guys, three engineers, no idea about running a business. Uh, I was two years out of college, or one year out of college, as was my co-founder and another guy who was you know, a professor at a university here in San Diego. And uh, so that's, that was the founding team. And uh, we had no idea how to run a business. We had never done anything like it. We didn't know how to sell anything. We didn't have any idea how to kind of do anything except build great product or great technology, not even great product, right? Um, and we had this opportunity to hire someone that actually Rakesh and others introduced us to. And uh, we ultimately ended up hiring her but for the longest time, we debated whether or not we should bring this person in because she wanted to be a co-founder, and we're like, but you know, we already started the company. Like, why would we bring you in as a co-founder and so on and so forth? But eventually, we wisened up and we actually said, okay, we're going to bring her on as a co-founder. And I will tell you that without her, that company would not have gone public. We actually took that company public many years later. But I think having her was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life, even though at the time, I almost revolted against the idea, right? Because like, what, what is it that we can't do that this person's gonna let us do? Uh, she's not even an engineer, right? <laughs> so, and, uh, and uh, so I, I, I will tell you that, you know, I, I've lived and learned and kind of understood the power of a complementary team in ways, and, and uh, to be honest, I, I learned it almost the, the best way possible. I, I, I did make a mistake. I brought this person on and actually got to see what kind of an impact that person made to the, to the outcome of a company. So to me, I think it's, a, it's an important piece to kind of make sure you have a well-rounded team, surround yourself with the best complements of what you are. And self-awareness is a very key part of building a complementary team. Most people, and myself included, when I started the company, I fought with some of my board members on why we needed to bring in, we brought in a CEO as well in addition to this person, 
like, why do we need a CEO? Like, I can do it. Like, uh, I can figure it out. Like, I'm smart. I went to IIT. Like, you know, what, I can figure it out. And, uh, and, but I was 21. So I think one of the things that I have also lived and learned is that there are some things I'm really, really good at and there are some things I'm not so good at. And kind of making sure that there's people around me that are great at the things that I'm not good at actually ends up make, building a great, great team. And uh, to kind of uh, try and stop and ask yourself what that is, I think will will help a lot and kind of make sure the team is right. Um, I, there's also things you should think about as you think about investors and advisors, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it later. So I'm going to continue Shwak's story. So uh, this lady that he's talking about, her name is Sukhinder Singh, and uh, uh, the, the other co-founder at Yodli. So Sukhinder, uh, actually, she went on to she was the president of Google. Uh, Asia and Latin America. So we hired her at Jungli, um, and I think the, what the, the the key skill that you got to get, you're going to have to get really, really good at, is making a, a, a judgment about people. And when you when you're wrong, you know the the other part, which is very hard, it's very hard for me, is to is to let them go also very fast, right? Because you will make mistakes. So so Sukinder was. Uh, Somehow made it to, the, she was, uh, is Canadian, and she was working in London for Peace Sky BA at, at the time. And she, somehow she got recommended to us at Jungli, and, and we spoke to her, I said, we gotta have her. There's just something about her drive which was so unique. And amongst the things that she did for us was the first call that anybody made for us into Amazon, in terms of sh showing them the power of what we're building with Sukhinder. And, uh, um, and so, so anyway, that, that, that was, uh, th the other thing is that, you know, when we built Jungli, um, and for that matter, White Rabbit, right? To me, uh, the way technology moves, you really need a very strong uh, person with the most recent grasp on today's technology. So I love companies where there's PhDs, because there's something deep in, in that space, and if, particularly if you can combine that with a consumer need, right? So at Jungli, we had uh, three great guys. Um, I know, I know, I know, I know, but 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 they're of the of 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 that capability, right? At White Rabbit, Jason Su, who's my who's my co-founder, uh, was recommended to us by Jeff Alman, who was on the uh, who was Larry and Sergey's thesis advisor. So now that part is fine. So you've got this this piece, right? So you you need to get a business guy to sort of complement the CEO and, and the space that you're in. So at at Jungli, we hired this guy Mike George. You might have heard a product called Alexa, right? Well, that that was Mike George's product at Amazon. So Mike was at Amazon and he stayed there till 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 a few months ago. So basically, Mike was he ran IT for the Washington Post and the Washington Post was our big investor. So I stole somebody from my from Washington Post and they were so pissed off at us. But he made a huge impact because he was just the right guy because we were at that point selling to newspapers, employment listings, and stuff like that. Right? At White Rabbit, there's this uh, guy in the room here. His name is John Lunetta. So. I've known John for, 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 for quite a while. So uh, he's an incredible business development guy, three, four startups later. So he got very, we spoke to, to him about, about what we're doing. He developed a passion for this as well. So he on his own volunteered to say, okay, you don't raise money. So this $10 million seed round we were talking about, John raised it. So uh, he created an, LL, uh, an LLC and went after Insane investors, you, you, you know, the type of people that we've got in, 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 this, in, as in the investor base is just crazy. They're like your, you know, people that would be your LPs, right? Uh, so the next step I did with John, who's so good at telling the story of White Rabbit, better than me, that I told him, okay, so you've raised this money, you probably have a lot of passion for this. So if you have a lot of passion for this, I know you're doing this networking thing, why the F don't you come and join us? I mean, what's the logic if you've got so much passion not to come and join us, right? So, so it's a person who's not like us or like me uh, for, for different reasons, but he's very, very p strong in his own right, right? So I think complementarity is, is very important, but key even there is, I mean, even more important than that is the, the sort of shared values, the chemistry, the worst possible days are when, when you fight with the co-founders, man. It's probably, Worse, I think, than fighting with your wife. <laughs> so, so anyway, just just a few 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 of my thoughts thought, thoughts on this. The team building is is everything. Sorry. 
Um, there, there was one thing that uh, what Rakesh had just reminded me of is I do think when you're thinking about your team, your, your, uh, your very senior team is almost the most important thing that you could ever build. And making sure that you're spending time uh, almost collecting what I'll call super duper stars is extremely important. And the one story that's very similar to the Sukinder Singh story that comes to mind was uh, when I tried to hire Sheryl Sandberg. She actually came out of the Clinton White House at the time. So she had no experience in Silicon Valley whatsoever. She was coming out of the White House um, and she wanted to do something here. And we met her as a management team and thought she was just phenomenal. She was just amazing and we had no uh, open spot. There was no spot to bring her in. We said, no, we actually don't know what we're going to have her do because she, she's not like a marketing person or a biz dev person or something. So it's not like she was looking for a particular role. So we said, we don't know what we're going to let her do, but we're going to give her an offer. We're going to get her to come, come and join the team. Unfortunately, we lost and Google won. So, uh, you know, and the rest is history. But, but the thing is that we were in this mode of actually making sure that we were bringing together and collecting the best people we could find. And even till today, I'd say that that team we built at Yoli oh, yeah. was probably like the best team I've ever worked with. And uh, I've never been able to replicate that again. And I think that's having that construct of just assembling the best team you can, even if you don't know exactly what each person is going to do, I think is important as long as they're all complementary. You guys have covered uh, a lot of what I was going to say, uh, but uh, a lot of startups fail because of lack of chemistry between the founders. So in that sense, you know, your founding team is, is, is really critical. And I think other theme that came out is complementarity. Uh, you know, you don't want to have, you know, four hotshot technologists in the team. You need someone who can do business development, sales, you know, articulate, I think as, uh, as Rakesh was saying, being able to explain the product, you know, really explain in common sense terms as opposed to sort of start spouting, you know, software code or, you know, or, you know, some, some hardware algorithms. That usually will lose most of the investors they're going to go talk to. So I think having a broad-based team is important and the chemistry is absolutely critical. I mean, you're going to spend so much time. And the key thing in the chemistry is you need to figure out a mechanism to deal with differences. You know, if you, if you get strong people, you will have different opinion. So you need to have some process whereby you can resolve the differences. You, you cannot just be doing screaming matches in front of you know, other employees. I mean, that, that's a sure way to demotivate the team. So in, the interview is, okay, you know, time out, we're gonna go hash out this issue among ourselves and then come back as opposed to you know, start turning into a big jam session as we are all used to doing in IITs. Okay, uh, um, let's, is that, if that section is done, let me get back to Q&A. Let me start with the first question. Who should be the CEO? The techie guy, the business guy, or uh, the evangelist, or who in that team of complementary guys? Because one thing I've heard is the CEO must be the representative of the company in front of the VCs. I don't know if that's correct, but if that's correct, somebody knows a deep technology, the other guy knows the big market, who should be the CEO? So I don't know what who should be the CEO, but uh, uh, I think there are some attributes that a good CEO should have, let's put it that way. And then you can decide who among the team has the right attribute. One is the person has to be articulate. They should be able to explain the product to the customers, the VCs, and so on. So the number one job of, the, of an early stage CEO is to raise money. If you don't have money, you really don't have the company. So they need to be presentable to the VCs. Uh, I think they need to have an ego that is well under check. Right? You know, they, are, they should not be thinking in terms of, I am right and you know, I'm the one who's making the decision. They need to have enough humility that they can accept other people knowing more than them. I mean, if your CEO is the smartest guy in the team, you probably have something wrong. Right? You probably need to have a strong technologist who knows more technology and a strong sales guy who knows more sales. And the CEO could be a generalist. Now, early stage, it depends. Uh, I think other thing is, the CEO is going to get a lot of arrows in their back. They're going to be criticized from all sides. So they need to have a pretty high, uh, let's say, threshold for accepting abuse and, and so on. <laughs> Rakesh, your views on the CEO? 
so I think uh, the, 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 I'm just going to pick on, on, on what Sanjay said, right? You've got to have a thick skin because in a startup, you know, what the, when Sanjay, I mean, you heard Sanjay's description, right? Basically, he started something which was going to be fundable six years after he started it, right? From 1991, 92, right? And all these people were giving him market reports about, you know, this is such a small market and it turned out to be a tens of billion dollar market, right? So I think the, the, the ability to take lots of no's, you know, if, if you've been, uh, as a bachelor, tried to look for a lot of girlfriends and get, got a lot of no's, that's a good. <laughs> 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 so because you do need a, a very thick skin. And, you know, you've, you've uh, I think a, 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 someone that, that, that was part of one of our companies who was, who was a VP of engineering said that the reason he doesn't ever want to become a CEO is that the a CEO has to sort of irrationally get out of bed every morning and feel, like, feel, feel you know, optimistic and enthusiastic, right? So, you know, if, if the CEO feels down, the whole company knows about it, yeah. So it's that, that telegraphs so fast, right? So I think, you know, you, that, that, that sort of thick skin stuff, the ability to, to just, you know, keep the company up on a, on a, on a high with, with, with energy. And of course, you've, you've got to be smart. You've got to be able to articulate the vision. You have to have a vision. You have to be able to build a team. You have to be able to do vision strategy tactics. You have to be able to sell what you're talking about. You've got to know when you're the wrong person. You know, I've had multiple things where, multiple times I've made mistakes stepping down as CEO as well when I look back on, on stuff. But I mean, I've had some great guys. There's a guy called Ram Shiram who's on Google's board uh, who we got in as chief operating officer at, at Jungdi. We could have done a lot of things together, but then Amazon came and bought us. So, uh, so I think it's, I think checking, you know, as, as Sanjay was saying, saying, checking in your ego, right? The ego doesn't, is only going to take you so far because if you have to be right all the time, then God help you, man, because then you don't need any employees. You better be just doing E equal MC squared at that point in time, right? So, it's it's uh it's as much art as as, as anything else. I mean, you know, short you see a lot of CEOs. Yeah. Um, I I'll give you my answer in two perspectives: one as a VC and one as a founder. Um, I think I'd say that one of the things that uh, as a founder that I think is important to have in your CEO is the ability to attract the talent. I mentioned earlier about the team being a biggest determinant of success. And different people can actually are, have different levels of ability to attract talent. And so if you can get the person that is the most able to attract talent. So for example, you got a Ram Shri Ram to come in as COO. Let's Netscape to come and join you. Let's Netscape to come and join you. That's a massive coup. And not everybody can make that happen, right? And the person that can make that happen of the founding team, right? You had Venki and Anand yourself, all these guys. And I think you were the CEO, right? And so the thing is that making sure that you, know, you have that person that can make those kinds of things happen is very, very important. Because it's far more important to get Ram Shiram to come join you than it is to have this guy as a CEO, that guy as a CEO, and so on and so forth, because it's very important. So I think the ability to attract talent is very important. And a part of that, I think, is, and I think a couple of these guys mentioned this concept of being the visionary, right? In, whether that vision is yours or not, that you come across to the rest of the world as the visionary, right? So you're able to articulate it, you're able to present it, and that oftentimes tends to be the thing that actually attracts the kind of talent that you can, and capital. But I kind of think that capital is almost like a, a, a follow-on. It, it will happen if you can get a lot of these other things to happen, right? Um, and that's, I think, a very, very important piece of it. The second thing is that you're a cheerleader, which is, I think you mentioned, getting up and being optimistic every day. And as easy as that might sound, uh, for those of you that are being doing the startups, you know it can be a shit show. I mean, more days than not, it's a shit show. And things are not going well, shit's breaking up, you know, things not looking good, doesn't look like you're gonna go another round in another couple of days, you're out of money, something not working, the product's not coming together, sales is not working. More days than not, things are down. And, uh, and it's so important that the person that's out there is able to kind of cheerlead the rest of the organization to keep fighting, because the only thing that's gonna get you out of that ditch is fighting. 
and the day you give up fighting, you're going to sink into that sinkhole that's that ditch, right? So, and trying to get people, get a whole team of people out of a ditch every day is, I think, a very important part of an early stage CEO. So that's my perspective as a founder. Um, as a VC, I'd say that the, the, one of the things that, that I'd look for in the CEO is, A, the ability to present and raise money because by the time we get involved as a Series A, what we care about is, can this person raise a Series B? Like, can they actually go get money from the next set of investors? Um, can they actually present this thing to the next set of investors with respect of the state of the business? Because we know, as venture capitalists, that businesses go up and they go down. And great people that can raise money can raise money even though the, even though the company is going down the toilet. And people that can't raise money can't raise money even though the company is going on a rocket ship, right? It's simply because they're just unable to present stuff. So that thing is an important element. The second important element, I think, is, is this person self-aware? By self-aware, we mean, like, by the way, a lot of CEOs where we found uh, funders actually have big egos, and that's sometimes a, uh, a nature of the beast, so to speak. But the most important thing we look for is whether or not there is self-awareness, which is, do you know what you are good at and what you're not good at? So you're going to surround yourself with the management team that can actually make sure that it, whatever your flaws or strengths are, that the company is not suffering because of your strengths and weaknesses, right? And that whatever your weaknesses might be, there's a, a, a good complement of management team members that make sure that the company as a management team has a very strong management team that covers the gamut. I think some uh, founders have stepped, sidestepped this issue uh, I don't know whether I know the right reason for it. Like Pradeep Sindhu, who founded Juniper, was chairman and CTO, not the CEO. He was chairman and CTO. So I guess because he's a very quiet, inert sort of person, he doesn't like, he's not a rah-rah kind of a guy. So I don't know if that's the reason for it. It's a pain in the ass. Uh. So <laughs> if you can get away with it, uh. I think most people would say, Fine. I think a lot of people tend to do it because of ego reasons, because they want to be CEO. Uh, and uh, you oftentimes find that that's actually, it's actually not a great job. It's a thankless job, so to speak, right? I mean, there's, you can never win in that job. And so it's a, someone's always pissed off and you're dealing with something or the other every day. So, you know, there, there's an old saying that A people hire A people and B people hire C people. Right, so what that means is that you know the CEO is secure in themselves. They will bring caliber A people, and if the CEO is the kind of person who believes that they're going to be threatened by smart people. They'll always hire someone that is less smart than them, and, that, and that's a short path to a disaster for the company. So you need to have CEOs who are pretty secure in themselves and will, will get try to get the best talent they can. And the other thing is that compared to when you know when Rakesh and I were doing our companies to now, one big change that has happened is. When I started out, it used to be, oh, you guys are an IT and you're a techie guy, you can't run a company. We need to pair you up with, quote, unquote, a white guy who will be the CEO of the company. Well, that, the world has changed. I mean, these days, you guys can go out and start a company and no VC is going to say that you can't be the CEO, assuming you have the right characteristics for it. You know, you know your pedigree or the country you come from or the color of your skin is not going to be a barrier. So in that sense, the world has changed, right? Yeah, big time. So if you think you really are capable of being a CEO, by all means, go for it. I mean, there is no reason not to be. But remember that you're signing up for something that's uh, not just a bed of roses. Okay, guys, uh, although we have a Q&A time now, I ask you, would you like to do Q&A now? Or would you like to mingle and mob these guys and eat some food if there's any left? <laughs> okay. What would you like to do? Do some more Q&A or just? A few Q&A. Huh? Okay, few QAs. Okay, wait, you had a turn. Let me give it to somebody new. Uh, Let's start here. So, if I'm forming a team, Anna, oh, I'm sorry, Anand Patel, IIT Bombay. Uh, if I'm forming a team, there's already I know that there's a lot I don't know that I don't know to look at the Joe Harry window type of thing, right? How do I go find someone who I think, firstly, I don't know what really I'm looking for because it's a don't know, don't know situation. How do, where do I go find these guys? I mean, if you don't know what, if you don't know what you don't know, then how do you find a team? I mean, I, what are you doing out there? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, 
I, I'm being very blunt, but I, I think you have no business doing what you're doing. He meant something different. CEO I'm looking for. Yeah. I know that I, I don't want to be CEO. I'm not capable of being CEO. <coughs> how, well, how, how do you know such a thing? Because even that is knowing something, right? So you can't admit that you don't know what you don't know anything if you know that you're not a CEO. But and I have this. a concept of what a CEO should be. For then example, then higher to that, no? By the way, I, first of all, I don't know if you should just go find a CEO. Like, that's not the first thing you should do. You should, like, um, I think bringing a CEO is oftentimes a decision you make once you are into the company building, and then if you decide that there's nobody on the team that can be the right CEO, then you actually go find a CEO. What you're actually looking for is not a CEO. What you're looking for is a co-founder. And that co-founder needs to be complementary to what the, the, the company you're trying to build needs. Right? So if you believe the company needs a sales guy and you're not the sales guy, you want to find the salesperson. If the company needs uh, an engineer and you're not the engineer, then the, that's, that's what you need, and so on and so forth, right? And the place you go to find people is actually people that actually, sh places where people that have a passion for whatever it is that area that you're going after hang out, right? Those could be meetups, those could be conferences, those could be places like this, you know, they could be incubators, they could be a bunch of different places where you can go find teams that will complement you. But again, like we talked about earlier, the team has to have a passion for what it is. It's not just about finding a guy you meet that says, I like this guy, he's an outgoing guy, he should be my CEO, right? Um, but you really want that person to be someone that actually truly has a passion for the space that you're trying to go after and has the complement of what that company needs at that point in time. I, th I think if you're founding a company, the key skill is, uh, the key skill is recruiting people, whether those are co-founders or anyone else, right? So uh, if you can't recruit people, you should not start companies. So, and you're gonna find people everywhere. You know, like Shwak said, meetups, colleagues, friends, Someone, you know, and the example that Munishi likes to give, right? Vinod Khosla stalking uh, Andy Bechtel team, right? Because he know, knew that Andy was the guy. So fine, he'd be outside his classes or whatever. Vinod was a student himself, right? So, I mean, if, you're, if you've read through the media that there's some, that Sanjay Mittal is your CEO, then stalk him, yeah? I mean, as an example, right? I'm, I'm not done. <laughs> 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 but uh, the, the, don't, the... Don't disclose my home. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the, the, the key thing really is, now if, you're not, if, if you don't see yourself as a great recruiter, then, then you need a co-founder in any case who's a, who's a great recruiter, and maybe that guy's a CEO. So I, I agree with Shwark, that's not necessarily your immediate next step. Your immediate next step is to get some money or just build your product, right? Because right now you're building products are so cheap. Just take some money from the household budget and, and build your product, and, and then things follow from that. Uh, Vivek Mangli, IIT Delhi. Uh, my question is, uh, when you're founding a team, is there an optimal ratio how you share the pie amongst uh, different people or, you know, especially from the VC perspective, you know, how, how would you want to? I don't think there's a VC perspective here. I think it's a very founder, it's a founder specific issue. And uh, I think the VCs will care about it if their perception of the contribution of the different members is not aligned with their share ownership. So for example, if you have three co-founders and they have equal ownership, and, but the CEO or the CTO or one of the other, one of the three co-founders is really the core guy that's driving this entire company and the other people are probably not contributing quite as much. Um, that can be a little bit of an issue because ultimately the person that the investors need to lock into this company doesn't have enough ownership to kind of lock them down as tightly as it probably needs to be. You ideally want them to be done a certain way. But oftentimes these things happen because 
when you're starting off as three guys in a garage, it's unclear exactly who is actually going to be the most impactful and who's going to be the biggest contributor and so on and so forth. So I think to the extent that there is a certain kind of uh, levels of contribution that basically is, is clearly apparent when you kind of go into it, I would recommend that you actually not go after a, what is easy. It's always easy to say, we'll just do it equal, right? Everybody's equal. Um, I actually think equal is a bad idea, unless you are in fact all contributing at similar levels, right? Uh, I actually would recommend that it is unequal. In fact, all the companies I've been a part of have been unequal founders, right? And, uh, and I think it works out much better because as time goes by, sometimes actually it's been unequal with, with the contributions not matching the unequalness. So that's also not a good thing. But either way, I'm still a big fan of more unequal sh pie sharing with an acknowledgement. By the way, that's actually one of the first tests of whether or not you guys can actually resolve differences and actually form a working relationship as a founding team. Oftentimes, going as equal founders is almost a sign that you're, you're you're avoiding your conflicts and avoiding your discussions. The hard conversations are going to happen at some point in your life cycle as a company. Uh, so sometimes I think, I think uh, somebody starts off very explosively and you get burnt out, he fizzles out, and you carried him at a certain level. You gave him that much talk around. Then what are you going to do with it, right? And what do we do with it, right? No, you let them go. Yeah. So I think one of the one of the problem that startups uh, I think uh, to follow on what you what uh, what you're saying is if you're if you do uh, it's it's tempting to make an equal distribution. Let's say three founders, and you don't know who's going to contribute what and how much is they're going to take. It's easy to say that we'll give one third, one third, one third, and let's say one person drops out and you've not taken the trouble to even set a resting schedule, and the person says, well, you know, you, you gave me a third, I'm, I'm dropping after a year, I still need to get a third. I mean, that is not a sustainable thing because other two people are basically going to be carrying. So the general rule I've seen is if you have three founders with equal shares, that's, that's a big red flag. So a, more, a two founders with, with big shares is, is okay. Three founders with equal shares in general is a bad idea. Is, is sort of my rule of thumb. Anand Rajaram told me a company with one founder I will never accept. Would you? Yes. Yeah, Anand said that's a red flag for me. <laughs> I, 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 so I don't know if it's a red flag, but basically it's better, your, your, your odds of success are more if you've got two, three people, uh, because at least for me, my brain somehow is smarter when I've got other people around me. When I'm by myself, I'm not so smart. So, but that's me. There's other people who could be very, very smart all by themselves. So, in general, I think he's right, but I don't think I can be absolute like that. I, I would invest in a single founder. I mean, by the way, Anand has invested in single founder companies. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Actually, um, Sanjeev Kumar uh, from uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, you asked my question, but let me rephrase it. Um, so my question was going to be, um, uh, are single founder companies inherently at risk, uh, even if they have come to a stage where they have uh, built a team, built the product, uh, well, at least uh, uh, have pilots going in now? That's my first question, and the follow-up is, uh, how, uh, how far um, can a company be um, uh, along the way so that they can still hire a co-founder? You can hire a co-founder the day before you go public, <laughs> if, if you are willing to do, to do so. Um, actually, Sukinder came on as a co-founder uh, almost a year into the company. And we did it because we decided that this person was unique enough and complementary enough and important enough to the company's success that we'd be willing to do it. And it was the best decision I ever made. Right? And I know that now. It didn't feel like that back then. Right? Um, and uh, to answer your first question, look, I think uh, single co-founders are not a problem per se, but I will tell you it is extremely stressful being in a startup. And when you have a single co-founder who basically doesn't have anybody to kind of share that stress with and to have that, those conversations with, you oftentimes ultimately end up having some other kind of support system form, whether those are advisors, some investors, board members, and so on and so forth. 
So ultimately, the rest of the team needs to be comfortable with whatever the support system that founder ends up building in order to kind of survive the stress of building the startup, that that support system is an echo chamber that they are willing to live with the consequences of, right? So it's really a lot more, I think, um, uh, it, it does kind of increase the variability. So meaning if the founder is a very strong person that actually very, has very clear points of view and has a very uh, um, um, strong agenda, so to speak, it's probably going to matter less. But if that founder tends to be someone that needs a little bit more support and uh, someone to bounce ideas off of and there's no co-founder, uh, it, it can end up with you know, sub suboptimal outcomes where they end up relying on one of their ex management team members. Oftentimes, it's a different management team member every quarter. It can lead to all kinds of things, it's just things to watch out for a little bit. So I, I would say there's plenty of instances of single founder companies that have been yeah. very successful. Huh? Larry Ellison, Jeff Bezos, Tom Siebel, Tom Siebel yeah. uh, um, Salesforce.com, yeah. Mark Benioff. So the, but it's just a lot more fun, I think. Um, provided you have, you have co-founders, you get along. Yeah. Provided you have co-founders, you get along. No, that, that's the worst. If you've got co-founders, you don't get, get along. Uh, it also depends on the personality. If there's somebody with a very strong personality, he's likely to be the dominant founder. The problems happen when those personalities don't align, right? So when there is a strong co strong personality and the other co-founder happens to be an equally strong personality, yeah. that's when all kinds of you know, stuff happens where you know, eventually they're just going to find something where neither one can give on and you know, start, things start to part ways and so on and so forth. Short Apple, Microsoft, you know, sure, there was Wozniak and, and Jobs, but Wozniak but they, faded. But that's right, but they're all, they're all then, they were not then, equal, and, and, and equally. Yeah. And then Jobs was the dominant, and that's you right. would think Jobs is the founder of Apple, that's basically. Right. That would be an right. accurate that's statement, right? right? Or... Uh, um, oh, there are actually four founders of Apple. Three actually, Markula. No, I'm just saying that, 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 that the dominant person, you know, over, you know, it's always going to be right. Paul Allen was sick, right? So he was for, for a long time not at Microsoft. So Bill Gates was the, the effectively the founder CEO. So uh, it's uh, it's more comfortable, I think, and it's it's more comforting for for an investor. What if the founder gets hit by a truck? Next question. There's another song for Hi, I'm Surya from IIT Madras. Uh, I kind of noticed that Rakesh worked on a hardware hey, startup. Can you have last name? Surya Satya Volu. Uh, Same thing as Shorts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Rakesh worked on R Media, which is a hardware startup, and slowly moved to various other companies, and most recent one is Weberu. Uh, my question is like, while there are a lot of problems still left, like that need a lot of hardware support, in my opinion, especially things like, you know, traffic congestion or road safety. Uh, that need uh, hardware support and startups that do hardware. Uh, so um, my question is, like, I mean, these days the VCs are kind of quite spoiled. Like, immediately you go, like, they ask for, do you have a product? How many users you have? Like, and come back after you have 10,000 users. Like, <laughs> typical reaction, like, almost. So I mean, any suggestions for a hardware-focused startup that's trying to solve some fundamental problems, like, you know, uh, transportation, uh, like, where we can kind of you know, uh, bring in some fundamental innovation, like in terms of uh, increased capacities and things like that. In the current environment, I, so I don't think the world cares. If it's, it's a hard. You know, you need a, a, a barrier to entry, right? So basically, if you're doing a hardware company which can instantly be done in China, that's not a good situation to to, to be in, right? No, so. The, the IT, right? Yeah. So I. So I. I think. You know, look at. Look at. Look at. Uh, what Google's done, Amazon's done, Microsoft's done, all of these hardcore uh, software companies have plenty of, uh, of hardware products, right? So Tesla, there's, I think uh, if ever, you know, venture, venture capital is very available for, for hardware right now than it probably ever has been. Fitbit and GoPro and, you know, so many things that, that might have been flame outs or not, uh, as long as you're solving something unique. So I don't think, I guess my answer is, you're not going to find lack of receptivity in the investment environment if you have a hardware company. I don't know if that was your question. Uh, so I guess my question is that around in the audience, like, and what you speak as are also software focused. Right? So, I mean, within the audience, they're talking about Apple. Well, there may be hardware related guys like Tesla, like you might see, like, more of the But uh, within, if you can maybe, like, 
By the way, there are a variety of different uh, incubators now that have been formed that are actually very hardware focused. So in fact, they only incubate hardware companies. And uh, so as, as Rakesh said, if, if anything, I would say that it is substantially more favorable to start hardware driven companies today than it ever was. Because, you know, early on, if you wanted to start a big, you know, big iron company or whatever else that, you know, was started before, it was actually very capital intensive, very hard to do so. And to, to his point, like the days of the PowerPoint funding are, are no longer the case. So you almost need an entire infrastructure now to get you up to the point where you can actually have a product and market and so on and so forth. So there are actually seed investors, there are actually incubators that have all been started that actually have a, a, a hardware focus. Um, I know Kena Ventures actually is one of the seed funds that actually does some of that stuff. There's one in the city that I, I the name's slipping now that actually does, uh, uh, it's a hardware only incubator. So there's quite a few people that are actually doing stuff like that now. think of so many examples. Nest, right? There's a VC called Rob Conybeer at, at Shasta who just specifically looks for hardware companies. Yeah. So... But to this point, like, you know, Rob will invest a little bit later than they're all three there. Yeah. But, but before that, there's still enough. No, but I, I think also you can all, you know, the, the building a hardware product is no more expensive than building a software product. You need a... Do you still need soldering iron? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Pankaj Kumar, uh, IIT Kharagpur. How do you see part-time co-founders, and would you, uh, would you, would you have a part-time co-founder, uh, or wait and get some money and then hire someone full-time? I don't think there's any such thing as a part-time co-founder. Uh, what I will tell you is that if you guys are basically kind of in the process of building out the product, right, um, and you're just doing that on nights and weekends, that makes sense. But ultimately, they need to commit to it as fully as you are, right? Meaning that uh, you're, you're in the process of building out a product. Maybe you're not capable of taking time off from work or whatever to kind of do this full time. Uh, you can build out your product till you pitch your angel investors and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can do that nights and weekends to get it all up and running. That makes perfect sense. But when you pitch your angels, the, you're not pitching a part-time co-founding team, right? You're pitching a team that basically is going off to do this product. So see, so in, uh, if you go to a VC, if you, if you train in Stanford University and you go to a VC, uh, Ray Lane told us this years ago that the VC will insist on a sign-off letter from Stanford that there are no obligations in terms of IP or uh, royalty or anything like that. Or else that royalty arrangement or whatever you have to pay to Stanford needs to be baked into that uh, valuation and agreement. Is that correct? I mean, the Ray Lane told us this years ago at Dai, at Dai meeting that a lot of Stanford students start startups. But uh, do they have a clear path and they do the work in the university and then come out with an IP? No. Uh, that's, it's what Ray told you is too formulaic and, and too dated. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, I've, we've got, uh, I've got White Rabbit, Jason, so it's part of the company. Stanford has no agreement with me and nobody's ever asked me. If, 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 if. Yeah, I actually think the IP stuff has gotten a lot cleaner in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, when I started Yodley, actually, it was a big deal where there was a lot of IP assignment stuff and people actually claimed IP for everything that, would, that was done while you were employed, even if it was done on your own time and all that stuff. All of that has gone away. I mean, most of that stuff is much cleaner now. So if you do stuff on your own time, it's yours. So when we, when we started Jungly, we gave Stanford a bunch of stock, and they just left us alone. That, that stock is funded a lot of professors and stuff like that. But, but. So these questions come into effect only if you're very successful. If you're not very successful, don't worry. <laughs> Next question.
you can learn, but not say it. Sales is a, like you get up in the morning and say, I'm going to make a deal. No, it's a personality type. What I'll tell you is, look, I've, I'm, I've learned a lot since I graduated as a 21-year-old founder who was basically an engineer. Um, I was the CEO of my last company. Um, so it was, it's, a, it's been an evolution. So yes, I have learned a lot. That said, what I will tell you is, you know, as you grow older and as you learn more and more about what you're good at, you'll realize that there are some things you're actually happy doing, you're actually good at doing, and you just stick to that stuff. And, and surround yourself with people. It's not because you can't learn to sell or learn to do marketing or learn to do product or operations or whatever else. Uh, it's because that there's somebody else that's going to be the superstar at that. And as I mentioned to you earlier, you want to surround yourself with the superstars for every little thing in your company, uh, wherever possible. So if you're not the superstar sales guy, even if you can sell, I would tell you to go surround yourself with a, a, a superstar sales team. And, uh, and as, as a startup founder, you want to find uh, different people at different stages of the company. So you may not need a sales guy to start with. In fact, there's almost no sales guy that can actually help you close the first two or three sales. You have to sell the first two or three yourself because you are the evangelist, you are the visionary, you are the person that actually came up with the construct of the product. And uh, only after you sell the first two or three days can you actually even bring on a salesperson that'll actually sell it. But just because you're supposed to do the first three sales doesn't mean you're the sales guy. Like you should make sure you bring in the sales guy that actually can help you scale sales. Right. I think the, 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 I just agree with one thing that Shwak said that for a long while I think the, the founder is the best sales guy. Not because he's a sales guy, because Everybody detects the, the, the tone of sincerity in what he's saying, right? And you're going to find that you may get a good sales guy, but you're going to make lots of mistakes in those hires. The VP marketing, I think, is the most endangered species in Silicon Valley. <laughs> because the, he runs right into the, he never quite captures the vision of, 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 this, of, of the CEO. So uh, I think sales also is probably better off because there's you know, tangible things that a salesperson can point to. But as the, uh, as somebody who's a founder of the company, you've got to at least be second best or third best in your country, in, in your company, and a lot of things. Sales is certainly one of them. I, I think just to build on what Rakit said, the first few sales are probably best done either by the founder or there's someone in the team who's very good at what I would call business development, relationship selling, someone who's good at finding you know, few key people in some company that they can really go make the right pitch get the confidence that they're willing to bet on a young company. That's what you really need to do. And I think a, a professional sales guy will probably have a tough time doing that because you know, the other person knows that they're talking to a sales guy. They need to really know that they're talking to someone who will be there for them when the things go wrong, which is, will, probably will go wrong for a startup. So that's where the founder or a you know, co-founder who is a good at business development really makes a big difference. So I think in response to your question is, if you're not that, get someone who can do that. I think it'll be too late for you to learn to do that at this stage in your company. Okay, guys, we're running out of time. Last question. Hello. Okay, yeah. Ben, IIT Kharagpur. Uh, so you have mentioned uh, something in the beginning of the uh, beginning of the presentation that you, know, you can always find a product market fit by you know building a product or uh, you know testing with uh, Facebook ads or Google ads. So let's say as a you know you get past that right, you build a product and you all you can always get a, a, a certain number of users. But then now you're trying to figure out okay whether how you know whether it is the right time to approach for seed funding. So the question I have is that. Like what are the level, what is the number of users kind of you should think that will kind of validate that, hey, you know what, I've proven it and it's time for seed funding. You know, in what framework I should sort of think about that? I don't think there's a general answer to such a question. I think uh, uh, if you can find a trend, uh, I think that's in, in many ways the most important thing, right? So if you, if you articulated a need, and you found um, people who are using the software, and you can point out to the fact that you know if I have more marketing dollars, then based on on all my metrics, I can 
<coughs> significantly grow the sales. Um, <coughs> I think the trend is more, more the point than absolute numbers. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think it'll basically also matter who you approach. Different seed funds have different kind of criteria that they look for. Some of them are looking for validation. Some of them are looking for products. Some of them are looking for traction. So I think uh, at the seed fund level, because of the diversity of the funds, sizes, uh, metrics, and so on and so forth, each one will have a slightly different you know, uh, driver of what, uh, what they're interested in doing. As you get later and later stage, those milestones get a little bit better defined. As I mentioned, like for Series A companies, having roughly about a million or dollars or so of recurring revenue is, is a generally good benchmark, though in some businesses that won't make sense and so on. But that's like a rough benchmark that's actually a reasonable assumption to kind of look at. But as you go earlier and earlier stage, like if you ask what does an angel want to see before they actually invest, even harder to define because every angel is very different, right? Some of them will just might just do it because they like your pitch, right? And uh, they're willing to back that, and and they're very passionate about that particular space, and and so they're willing to back that. Okay, guys, with that uh, we'll close for this evening, and we will see you back here on eighth of March. Uh, Naim will be conducting the next two sessions. Will be very crucial because it's fundraising. It's a gray area for most of you. Okay, and I'd like to thank our panelists, Shwark, Rakesh, and Sanjay. Sanjay unfortunately got an urgent call back from home. He had to rush back. So now you're free to mob them and do whatever. There's no, I think most of the food is finished anyway. Okay, thanks and bye.